This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am uh, going to call to order excuse me, seeing a presence of quorum calling to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee at um, 6.31 p.m. on uh, Thursday, August 13th. Um, so we'll take a, a roll call attendance. Um, please say present when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. And McDonald present. Ms. Hall? Thank you. All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 6.32 p.m. And we'll do a roll call attendance. Uh, Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. Mr. Menino? Menino present. Ms. Barlow? Barlow present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. And Hall present. And um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Region School Committee, I'm calling that committee to order at 6.32 p.m. Um, and I'll take roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Mr. Menino? Menino present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer? Stance are present. Uh, and Sullivan not present. Um, McDonald's present. Um, we are now uh, to order. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not consistent in calling out that we are being live streamed on Channel 15 in Amherst as well as online on um, Amherst Media, and we are being recorded. Um, our first order is to approve our minutes from um, three of our past meetings, July 20th. 21st and 28th. So maybe we'll start with uh, July 20th. Um, um, I have a couple of things. In uh, July 21st, in number six in the superintendent's update, it, it mentions a Mr. Seek being appointed principal, but it doesn't say which school. So I thought perhaps that should be included. And on page five in the second paragraph, I think the word lesion should be liaison. I think that's just a typo. And on page six, um, the next to last paragraph, it says Mr. Slav, and I think it should be Mr. Sloven. Just again, it's just a typo. And on the in the minutes for the 28th, on number seven, the superintendent's update, second paragraph. The last town, um, it references the town leadership is meeting in person, and I actually think it's supposed to be the school school leadership team is meeting in person, not not the town. So that's what I have. Okay. I did, um, before we go on, on all three of the uh, minutes, um, I think it's important because these are joint meetings of three different committee meetings um, that for each member we cite which um, uh, committees they're they're representing because several of uh, several of the folks are um, from a town but representing the region. So, as an example, um, uh, Margaret Stancer says Pelham. It should probably say Pelham, comma region. Because um, not everybody on this list is a member of the region as well. And then I also think that um, I'm called out as chair. I think Ms. Hall should also be called out as chair of the Pelham School Committee. And that, that would apply to all three. <clears throat> Mr. Demling? Um, on the 721 minutes on page four, under the phasing models section, uh it's uh it's uh, i'm making a reference to fate uh it's uh it should be fape so it's all it's a acronym all capitals f-a-p-e yeah 
Ms. Hall? Uh, one small thing I saw on Ms. Stancer's comment about the appointment of the principal, it was also a misspelling. It should read Mr. Sadiq. It said Mr. Sadiq. It should read Sadiq. Um, Ms. Kenny? Um, so I, I think it was on the 721 on, it's page 25 of the whole thing. I didn't write down what, uh, what page it was of those, uh, but it says, um, something about Dr. Morris and Mr. M Dr. Gurieva, the, the children are like her own. The way it read, it sounded like Dr. Morris said it, but I think it was Dr. Gurieva who said it. And then on the 28th, in the superintendent's update, there were also DESE guidelines about chorus, theater, band, and PE that weren't mentioned. That was it. I had a couple other, um, just minor, on page 17 of July 20th. Um, about two thirds of the way down in that big block paragraph, there's um, reference to um, Dr. Morris said that our human resources office made documentation about health and safety for each staff member. I'm, I'm not sure that that's actually, I think it's really just made doc, has documentation about pre existing conditions. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what was what was said that it, the documentation about health and safety doesn't, um, I don't think is, is, is correct. Um, and then just a minor, just two lines below where it says accommodate the preferences, but if it does not state what happens, if there is, but it, so I think just delete if, it should say, but it does not state. On um, the next page, it's, um, page 18 in that same meeting. Um, the second big block of text that begins with Dr. Morris said that staff, um, four lines down, it says Ms. McDonald said, we will accommodate staff and that we will come up with creative ways. I think it should be, we will seek to accommodate staff. Um, and then under C, future meeting plan, planning, it says Ms. Spitzer said that the union for our organization is for the whole district. I'm not sure that, that may be accurate, but I, I recall that Dr. Morris said that, but that it may be that Ms. Spitzer was repeating something that Dr. Morris said earlier. I don't know. You don't remember. Okay. <laughs> Are there other um, changes? Ms. Spitzer? Very minor, and maybe somebody already caught it, but on page six of the July 21st meeting, um, it says, I think, Mr. Slove, S-L-O-V, and it should be Sloven. Anything else? Somebody like to make a motion? Do we need one for each committee? I believe yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I move that the Pelham School Committee accept the revised minutes for of the of the joint school committees for July twentieth, twenty first, and twenty eighth. Okay. Great. Is there a second from Pelham? Second. All right, moved by Stancer, seconded by Menino. Any further discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. All right, thanks. Mr. Demling, you had your hand raised. Um, I move that the Amherst School Committee approve the minutes of July 20th, July 21st, and July 28th, 2020 um, as amended. Lord second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Lord. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? 
Hearing to none. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Five, zero. And I'll make a motion for the region to approve the minutes of July 20th, 21st, and 28th of the joint school committee meeting um, as amended. Second. Was that Ms. Spitzer? Yeah. Um, moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the minutes are approved eight to zero. Um, give me a sec. Um, great. And now we'll move on to um, public comment. Um, we have one voice message and um, some text. Uh, while I will share the text, um, the email um, now while I pull up the, um, the voice recording. Um, are folks seeing that? Um, and these, uh, these have been posted also on our website. So for folks that are watching um, online or on TV and having a hard time reading, um, it is available if you go to the Region School Committee Agendas page, um, this PDF is posted there. That was a little fast. Too fast, sorry. Yeah.
Okay. Everybody ready? Um, I will now play a voice recording. Dear school committee, this is Arne Scalanami, an amorous parent of three children in our schools. I now have a better understanding of Model 4, but I don't agree with the decision to keep students in grades 7 through 12 fully remote for the first two months of school, and then return to only one day a week of in-person instruction. Grades 2 to 6 do get five days a week, but only start in person in October or November. All students should be in school starting in September, and 7th through 12th graders deserve at least two days a week of school. The long phase in of grades 2 to 12 is based on understandable and shared fear of COVID. We all want to keep our kids, our teachers, and our community safe, and we all worry that opening schools could jeopardize that. But the numbers tell another story. As of yesterday, August 12th, Amherst had 15 current cases. That's out of around 39,000 people. We can look at the numbers in a lot of different ways, but 15 out of 39,000 just doesn't justify keeping 75% of our 3,052 students out of school for months. The damage done already is staggering. All children lost a lot of learning in the spring and many suffered real emotional harm. And consider students with moderate learning disabilities in grades four to 12. They aren't in school at all until November and most then only get one day a week giving them little chance of catching up or having their IEPs and 504s followed with fidelity, however hard our educators try. And then there's the issue of equity. We know very well that there's a wide range among families in their ability to support kids with remote learning, which despite best efforts cannot measure up to in-person learning. With Model 4, you're asking thousands of families to come up with a plan to supervise their children at home on about four weeks' notice. Families who can will have to shell out thousands to hire tutors and nannies to teach their children at home, while families who can't afford that will have kids at home without real supervision and without adult guidance with distance learning. The bottom line is that few children can get a free and appropriate public education under Model 4. The Massachusetts State Constitution requires that our communities cherish the education of students, specifically by supporting public schools, and in promoting Model 4, you are breaking that promise. Finally, as we approach November, we approach flu season with symptoms that look very much like COVID-19, making it harder, not easier, to reopen schools safely. If we have a bad flu season, or if COVID numbers rise this winter, we may well not be able to safely reopen school this year at all, which will mean that students will go 16 months without in-person instruction, suffering academic and social emotional harm that we cannot repair. September and October is our chance to make sure kids are in school. We don't know what the future brings, but we do know that the numbers are low right now. We have tents for outdoor learning. We have robust safety measures. Take care of our kids and let them go to school. Thank you for your time and care in serving our children. And that concludes um, public comment. Um, moving on to our next um, item, we have our superintendent's update from, um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Sorry, I was having a little connection issues, um, but I think they're resolved. And if I get choppy, if you all are hearing me in a choppy way, just someone shout. Um, so um, I've got a number of small things. So one is just that uh, we've been working for a while at, at uh, lining up an HVAC ventilation assessment for all of our schools, and we've been successful. And that'll start at the end of next week, the beginning of the following one. And that's really looking at uh, airflow and ventilation in our classrooms, particularly focused on our, the classrooms we're assuming will be our phase one classrooms, um, as well as some others, because um, we have a little bit of time to focus on uh, the ones not in there, but um, that's something that we'll bring back to you in the public, but something that I know um, there's concerns about ventilation and obviously HVAC folks are in high demand, uh, but we've secured one that's working in a number of other districts in Western Massachusetts. Um, and that's what they have experts in is HVAC. They'll be able to assess airflow a uh, number of times air turns over and then also make recommendations for improvement, which is both of those things we need. Uh, uh, Ms. Consolino, our nurse manager, will have full health and safety guideline out for uh, next week. We had most of that in the long document we sent to DESE, but this one is uh, more descriptive uh, in terms of protocols um, for, in, you know, when students and families, uh, when students and staff return to school in a number of different situations, pretty lengthy document. We'll have put that on our website. Uh, last night, we had a medical, uh, we had a, what I thought was a, a really interesting panel of four medical doctors who volunteered to come on and um, 
It was translated into four languages versus Google Meet. We had Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Korean uh, with live translation uh, via, a via a separate line. Uh, but I learned a tremendous amount last night. Um, got some positive feedback also from members of the community. So I want to publicly thank the four doctors for making time in their very, very busy schedules these days uh, to connect with um, the community in that way. It's still available on YouTube, on the district's YouTube page. Um, it's also on our um, our fall 2020 page. The video was saved and is uploaded there. Tents starting to go up next week, working with the town because the tents are large enough to be, uh, they need permits. They're not like the casual little ones you blow up behind the house. These are 30 by 30 tents. And so we're working effectively with the town and working on getting that uh, up and running, uh, which is great. Thanks to our facilities department for that. Uh, next week, we'll have um, admin professional development uh, focused on two things, which I've talked about before, the social emotional needs of students and staff and the bright folks from the bright program, not our bright program, but the, the, the head of the bright program that works um, and facilitates the program in multiple districts. We'll be facilitating that as well as anti-racism work. Uh, Ms. Cunningham and HR will uh, facilitate much, of, and the HR department will facilitate much of that work next week. Uh, I want to thank, uh, publicly he's not on the call, but um, Obed, uh, who you met at a couple meetings. Uh, he's been a fabulous intern from Amherst College. Uh, today is his last day, so we thanked him all at our leadership team meeting this afternoon. We're hoping to figure out a work away with Amherst College where he can continue with us in, in some ways in the fall. Um, and, you know, he aspires to work in schools and He's been, we uh, he continue to say how much he's learned, but we've, we've, uh, we've learned a tremendous amount from him and um, just has a bright future. And uh, we'd love to uh, continue to work with him, but want to publicly thank Obed for his work this summer. Um, air purifiers with HEPA filters and UV lights are in. They're being put together by facility staff. The elementary schools are pretty much outfitted with them and getting onto the secondary now. Um, so thanks to the facility staff. Um, I really want to thank, and this will be a theme, uh, facility staff, um, if you try to buy these same products right now, uh, the wait is very long. And so our facility staff uh, really worked effectively uh, with our public health staff, both in the town and the schools to make purchases when things were available. Now everyone's scrambling to buy these things. And so we feel really good. We have uh, tons of boxes. Uh, if you've been in our middle school, which most of you haven't, but I need to, one of you has, um, you'll see a tremendous number of these and our facility staff have been um, putting them together and installing them in spaces. Uh, this one right side, right side uh, next to my office that I hear running. And so really appreciate uh, the forward thinking on that because you know that'll be a theme uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, a couple months ago, we also, or about a month ago, we also purchased small desks for young students. Our, our youngest students typically use tables. Um, we had enough desks, but the middle school, high school desks don't go down to the right size for our youngest learners. Uh, these are also items that I hear from my superintendent listserv are out of stock for, for um, I heard today, till early November, but ours are slated to be delivered in early September, well in time for the school year to start. So thanks again for our folks being on top of things. Um, I will show you the first water bottle, if you can see it. Um, it's, got a really, it's got our logo on it. So we've purchased enough water bottles for all students in the district, being that water fountains, yeah, there we go. Uh, cannot be uh, utilized, and um, so we're really pleased that those are starting to come in. They'll be in by the end of the month in the full full amount. Um, another one where I just want to appreciate a staff member, um, the um, the there's a critic. I sort of referenced this last time, but I want to talk about it again. There's a critical need or critical slowdown on Chromebooks um, internationally, and that's because uh, the producers of Chromebooks used a vendor for a certain part, and I can't describe the parts of computers. Uh, but that that company uh, was uh, found to be guilty of uh, labor law, international labor law, and so Chromebooks that were literally in um, in the United States had to be sent back uh, for good reason because of the labor piece, but it's a huge piece, a uh, huge issue across the state. Actually, the Commonwealth has decided to support schools to do mass purchasing that we, you know, districts reimburse them for. The slated estimated time for Chromebooks is early October because of the slowdown and China's the supplier of many, many Chromebooks. Um, and our IS department was able to find a vendor who could get us Chromebooks that will arrive the first week of September. Um, so many districts signed on and they're not going to get uh, more Chromebooks till October, but we'll get them in time. Uh, we also have purchased iPads for our youngest students just based on, you know, where they are developmentally, the touch screen and using a keyboard, uh, not so essential when you're, uh, you know, five years old. 
And so all of those are also coming the first week in September. So just, you know, really creative thinking and hard work to get all these things in in time. And I want to thank the IS department not only for that, but all the collecting of Chromebooks they're doing now. And, um, you know, many times I say, why are you collecting if we're going to use them again? Because they need to be updated every year. And otherwise, if you don't, then they will stop working. And we don't want that to happen to our students. So tremendous amount of devices in and out and, um, you know, really, really wonderful job. Uh, I was over last week to, um, to uh, Wildwood and Fort River to see the progress on the update on the what used to be known as quads. And both projects are operating uh, very effectively. They're ahead of schedule, It'll be done by the end of this month. And just enormous, nice spaces. Um, it, it, it's sort of amazing. The IS department has now transferred the screens. They wanted to make them more centered because it's instead of, you know, you only had a quarter of a room and now you have half. So that got done today. Um, so I know I'm just doing a, a lot of work updates, but I do think it's relevant to the committee and the communities to hear these. Um, you know, we have um, some work that has happened. We had an application for some of our schools for the Harvard Graduate Schools Diverse and Equitable Schools Program, uh, RIDES, uh, and um, the application uh, was for some school-based staff to be involved in that, and that would be supplemental to the additional ongoing anti-racist work, and they actually did not get into the August workshop because in the application they essentially cited that they all the work they're doing and they said no 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 our first year is people who aren't doing the things you're doing you can get in a little bit later so i appreciate the activism of our principals to be applying and also the recognition that this is part of ongoing work in the district this isn't brand new um, so thanks to them and, and thanks miss cunningham and many many community members who are contributing to the anti-racist curriculum that's being worked on over the summer finally my last update sorry uh, this was a longer one um, is that I do have updated figures as of 2.30 today. So the phase one family survey about return to school went out yesterday. Um, there are 216 responses, which is about 40% of the folks who got that survey. Um, and 156 or 72% of the people who got the survey indicated they wanted, they chose to participate in in-person learning. Uh, and 60 or 28% indicated they'll participate in fully remote learning. Um, so I'll continue to update the committee as we get more information, but that's about you know 40% uh, of respondents and those are the numbers we have as of 2.30 today. We did not have time to go back and check in the last five hours. And that's my update. Okay. Ms. Seeger. Uh, Dr. Morris, can you repeat who the survey went out to? Sure, I'm sorry. It went to the parents' guardians of um, students who are in first phase. So that would be preschool students with disabilities, kindergarten, uh, next, in, when I say grade levels, I'm talking about the upcoming year. Uh, incoming kindergarten students, incoming first grade students, um, SLIFE or beginner ELL students, students who are in specialized special education programs, or and students who do not have a permanent residence as per McKinney-Bento law. Thank Sorry, you. I should have been more explicit. Any other questions? Um, thanks for the update. I have a couple things. Um, so I guess one question I have is how long are we going to have to wait um, to get results from the HVAC assessment? Um, and I think it's great that we're doing that and want to thank everybody who's worked on, on, on getting that done. Um, I'll just go through all my questions at once. The other question is about the iPad and Chromebooks. I think last year, you know, we encouraged students who had their own devices at home to use them. I'm thinking specifically for the kids who are young enough so they didn't already have a school issued one. So I'm curious, this year, are we going to be giving iPads to everybody? Is it only going to be going to the kids who stayed in need? Like, I'm curious about how much we've purchased. Have we, have we got enough now for each student who could possibly ask for one? Um, and then it sounded like you said 28% requested remote. Was that right? Okay. I just went. And then one final question was just about the professional development. I think that sounds wonderful that we're doing the anti-racism and the bright work. I'm wondering um, when we're gonna potentially see some professional development around using some of these new tools for remote learning. Cause I think there's been, at least I've been hearing from, from folks that they'd like to have more professional development around the tools that are needed for remote learning. By folks, you mean families and caregivers? Um, no, I think everybody could probably. Sure, I just was trying to. I, I was thinking about staff actually, particularly with that comment. I know that we have those extra ten days now built into the calendar. Are, are we going to wait until that point to start the professional development, or will there be some potentially starting sooner? And maybe this is something for 
the executive session later on to this evening too, but um, those sure. are my thoughts. Thank I, you. So the timeline for HVAC, my sense from them is it's pretty quick work. They have a, I can't tell you what it is, but an expensive uh, machine that they bring in and then it tests airflow and um, how many times, how quickly the air turns over. Um, and um, then they look at um, the si building systems and they, you know, it, it's not something that it takes three weeks for them to come back with that information. I can't give you exact dates, but when Mr. Roy Clark and I spoke to them over the phone, uh, the data readings they're getting, they're able to do 15 to 20 rooms a day uh, and collect those. And I think some of the recommendations make it a little longer, but they understand that schools are under, you know, tight timelines for, for that work. Uh, in terms of devices, it doesn't really matter in person versus remote because, as you know, we're not going to use computer labs and things like that. So uh, we've ordered enough where there'd be one per student, um, whether they choose to be, you know, whether it ends up being uh, a student accessing it remotely or a student who's in school. Um, you know, I think at the kindergarten level in school, we're pretty, we try to be pretty light with um, screens and things like that. But, but there are opportunities. Some of our literacy programs um, and math programs do have applications, and particularly literacy has applications that are uh, accessible via iPad. And iPad is actually the preferred source because, you know, it's the touchscreen makes a huge difference when you're, you know, just based on the age of the child. And the PD, I think we'll, that'll come up in the on the agenda in the virtual education or virtual learning update. So if you're um, okay waiting for that, I think it would just, it, it's in the slides, so I think I can describe it more definitively. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the superintendent? And we'll go to Ms. Kenny first and then back to Ms. Spitzer. Ms. Kenny? So, thank you. Um, so the iPads and Chromebooks will be for all students in all of the districts, so like, first graders in Pelham, whether they're in school or at home, will have iPads. I think first grade is still on Chromebook. Yeah. preschool <laughs> kindergarten that we're thinking about for iPads. Um, yeah, Pelham is a little bit of a different draw, and we have to be a little more creative with how we fill the needs um, because it is a different budget, and, and the COVID funds aren't don't go quite as far in that community as they do in in Amherst or the region. So, um, but that is uh, where we feel we're, we're collecting them now. So assuming we collect what we expect to collect and have a yield that's not wildly different, we don't expect 100% coming in in perfect condition, but we, we expect most, uh, we should be okay. Um, and we do have some backup plans if we're not, um, we're not there. It uh, was the case last year too, that many families in Pelham chose uh, who were doing remote. Uh, well, we're all doing remote, but many families in Pelham opted uh, or suggested they did not need a Chromebook. Uh, last year, so we want to supply for families who need, but um, Pelham had really different patterns than Amherst of the region in terms of needs of both hotspots and Chromebooks. Any other? Oh, oh yeah, Ms. Spitzer. Sorry. As long as nobody else has another question, I, I forgot to say one of the things I had written down. Oh, just one question for the kindergarteners. Um, I know there's always this issue about getting people registered and given the timing of everything where we're sending out the kind of the binding survey around, are you coming back or not? And sometimes at this point in year, we haven't actually identified everybody who's going to be starting with kindergarten. So could you give us just an update on where we're at with registration for kindergarten in regards to like past year's expectations and things like that? Yeah, so they're they're um, if you look five years ago as in uh, live births, they're they're sort of tracking pretty consistent with that. They're a little lower, but not particularly. People have done a fabulous job doing outreach, and we've gotten a number of families who have registered actually in the last couple of weeks. Um, once we get our yield, you know, the survey is good till next Tuesday. We'll look at uh, what our class size is, and if we do get uh, additional registrants after, and we do have space in classes, then we would want to give families that option. Um, and if we don't, then that's going to be a, a more difficult, just candidly, a more difficult conversation because much like families who choose virtual at the beginning of the year, we can't casually have um, students move into in-person learning uh, if there's not space and we have to be really cautious about that. So, um, you know, I want to really thank Dr. Guevara and Ms. Richardson. Uh, you've met both of them, I think, in the past. Um, Pelham folks might not have met Ms. Richardson. She's our ELL director or coordinator, excuse me. Um, and they've both done tremendous amounts of outreach uh, in various communities. And we've seen a big uptick, um, particularly in certain areas or certain pockets of our community of families registering. Um, and Ms. Martinez, who's our registrar as well. Um, so thank them for the work. The numbers compared to like even a month ago are significantly different. And, and uh, we feel like we have a better handle on the yield. Mr. Demling? 
Um, so I'm glad Ms. Spitzer mentioned uh, uh, kindergarten registration because it popped up a question uh, for me about uh, Caminantes. So we spent a long time last year talking about the uh, ramp up of the uh, Caminantes program and the enrollment, the balancing of the numbers. Obviously, when we designed that program, we did not anticipate where we would be now. Um, I would imagine that that is quite the massive curveball to this very young program that we all care so much about. If you could give us maybe just a little bit of update about where that's all at. Yep. So Ms. Chamberlain, uh, Ms. Richardson and I, and I have met about it probably three times in the last eight days, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we are tracking particularly the Spanish speaking population in kindergarten um, or the bilingual population, you know, the, the pop kindergarten students with Spanish language background is, is the accurate way I should have said that. And we want to make sure that we're um, situated to have relatively balanced classes. Uh, until we get feedback of which students are returning. Uh, like, I don't know any of the kids. I just got the raw numbers from Ms. Ms. Moreland. When we actually look at the students who are choosing to return, we'll be better able to um, do that. At this point, uh, I think it's better to, to wait till we talk about virtual education in kindergarten, because there's actually some logical places that we should, uh, when you look at the virtual education kindergarten uh, draft schedule, I think some natural questions will come up about common ideas, and I'd rather do it a little more within the flow of the agenda if that's okay with Mr. Demling. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Ms. Barlow. Hi, um, could you please repeat what percentage of the families answered the phase one survey? And I'm sure. also curious if you could share if there are discrepancies by school or was it just 28% that shows um, remote learning across the board? Were they pretty even? So I did not do that level of data analysis yet. This was something, um, you know, it, it's the good news is we have it translated into five or six languages. The bad news is uh, collecting results for those five or six languages. Is, it creates a little bit of a data slowdown. Um, so we have 216 responses. I'll just repeat the numbers. Um, uh, so far, it went out to about uh, the families of about 500 students uh, in that vicinity. So it was about 40% of the um, respondents um, or the total uh, people that it was sent to. 156 or 72% indicated they would participate in in-person learning. 60 or 28% um, of students indicated that they would participate in fully remote learning. I did not yet have a breakdown. And, I, you know, for me, I'm curious about... Um, by school, but also by, um, you know, are these kindergarten and first grade students? Are they preschool students with disabilities? Are they uh, McKinney Vento students? Who's responding? Who's not responding in the first day? You know, we are actively, you know, going to work on a reminder system on Monday and make phone calls if needed because uh, we know um, we're trying to do a number of forms of outreach, not to convince the families of anything, to be really clear, just to make sure they got the information. If they have questions, they have a place to go. Um, so again, thanks to Dr. Guevara and Ms. Richards, the same people I referenced earlier. They're kind of leading the charge, and Dr. Brady actually on the special ed front. They're leading the charge to see who's responding and who needs um, a contact. Uh, and I, again, I want to be really clear. It's just about providing information. Uh, we really feel like this should be a family's choice, that they shouldn't be any... Um, preferences from anyone who contacts them. It's just making sure people get all the information and can make the choice that they think is right. I mean, I think one thing I liked last night that the doctor said is, you know, when families make, you know, whatever choice families make, it's the right choice for them, you know, and I think that's right. And that's the, that's sort of the motto and the ethos that we're trying to enter this. Um, you know, we had someone, a couple of people look at even the survey questions to make sure you know, we wanted to be really balanced uh, about how we approached it. And we'll see if those numbers shift over time. We do have the town halls on Monday. Uh, you know, I know some families want to hear a little more, and that's an opportunity uh, for people to hear it. So we made the deadline Tuesday. Originally, the deadline was going to be Monday, but we felt like that was the right thing to do once we realized that we couldn't do the town hall sooner. Um, but I'll certainly um, keep the committee updated once we get the final tallies. And at that point, absolutely, we're going to break it down by school and, and, and uh, in many other ways. I think we've um, had all the questions. I just want to call out, I know you've said this, Dr. Morris, already, but it's sort of appreciation for the forward thinking of, of many in the district staff in terms of ordering supplies and furniture and equipment and everything. And I just want to call that out again, because I think we're in a position that we're able to, able to consider in-person um, uh, learning um, at the beginning of the, our school year because of that forward thinking and that, and that um, planning, 
the budgeting, you know, putting things into place. And that's, that's huge. So I, I just, you know, huge kudos to everybody that was involved in getting, you know, whether it's hand sanitizers, PPE, um, desks, furniture, air filters, the construction um, that's happening in our schools, it's, it's phenomenal. So I just want to express my, you know, great, deep, deep appreciation. Yeah. And yep. if I could add to that, someone I should have mentioned, uh, and he would not want me to do this, is, is Doug Slaughter, our finance director. A heck of a year to be a first year finance director. Um, you know, and the good news is we keep on getting grants and we have applied for more. We're going to hear more next week, uh, which is uh, really great for the budget and also adds a tremendous workload, not just to him, but Shannon uh, in his office. And, um, you know, again, the CARES Act, all those things are great, but from a budgeting and uh, record bookkeeping perspective, it adds an additional lay of, layer of challenge, and we're buying substantially different things that we have in the past, um, and everything's on a tight timeline. So, you know, um, not to go overboard on, but I think the, the business office and Dr. Slaughter really need um, to be acknowledged as well. Mr. Demley? Yeah, so just on that exact same theme, I just did also want to publicly thank the town of Amherst and uh, the t specifically the town manager and the town council. Um, there are a number of districts uh, in the Commonwealth that are not getting all the CARES money they need from their respective towns. And that's not necessarily to say that, um, uh, that the towns themselves don't have their own needs. You know, this is, it's, this is a zero sum game of funds. Uh, we happen to be in a position where all the CARES Act uh, procurement that we need to do, uh, the t town of Amherst, uh, you know, the town council and the town manager have been very accommodating with, with all our needs, um, you know, according to the superintendent. So, um, you know, we, that's not the, the case everywhere. And it's a word, I'm very appreciative of that. And I, I just want to publicly acknowledge that that's, that's a very positive thing for us um, right now. And it, it enabled all that proactive uh, 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 activity going forward. Great. Um, great. So I think um, move on, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is a chair's update. I don't um, have anything to update. Um, so maybe that will catch us up a little bit. Um, chair Hall, did you have any um, no, chair. nothing tonight. Thank you. Um, and uh, school committee announcements. Does anybody on the committee have an announcement? Ms. Seeger and then Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Lord. Ms. Seeger. I recently uh, wrote a letter to Senator Comerford and Representative Blay about homeschooling this year and the districts being held harmless. If anybody would like a copy of what I sent, you're welcome to take it, uh, change it as you see fit, and send it along as well. I heard back from Representative Blay that she was going to take my questions and, and pass them along to folks because she had a bunch herself. But it would be a shame if parents did choose homeschooling for their children and the district was penalized for it because um, all options are on the table and families need to do what they need to do and the school district shouldn't be penalized. So thanks. Mr. Sullivan? take this mask off now so it's just some observations i joined the meeting at seven with my mask on at 708 i had to adjust it for the first time because it was uncomfortable at 710 i started playing with it and by 714 i lost interest in listening to mr moore dr morris and i started oh, you're muted oh so I couldn't keep my attention on the speaker because I was just struggling to keep the mask on to see how long I could do it. So I failed. I, it was like 28 minutes that I was able to somewhat keep it on. So I just, that was my experiment for the night. Ms. Lord. I'd like to invite everyone to the School Equity Task Force meeting Wednesday August 19th from 6 to 7.30. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on to new and continuing business. Um, we have the, we're now going to review the 2020-2021 school calendar. And I believe, is there a new one that's not in the packet? I was going to ask if I could display and explain the changes. Um, so uh, before I put it up, uh, last night we received some what I consider excellent feedback from uh, the APEA on the calendar. So um, I, it's a little different than what was in the packet, not tremendously, but I want to um, display the new version. It was emailed to the committee just earlier today because it took us a little while to integrate that feedback in that we received yesterday afternoon or evening. I 
it's all blending together. So the short story on this is that um, Stafford return, you know, it's hard to, let me see if I can display it. It's hard with vertical uh, files, but Stafford returned when they were planning to return, which is the 31st. Uh, but given the state's uh, reduction in the number of days in school from 180 to 170, the first 10 days would be for professional development. The 11th day, the 15th of September would be for convocation. Uh, and uh, the first day of learning for all students in grades one through 12 would be the 16th, obviously some, some virtual, some in person. Uh, we'd have orientation days, uh, preschool and kindergarten with the first day of those being the 18th of September. Uh, some of the feedback was, and it's totally accurate as we <laughs> were doing schedules, uh, we did um, remove uh, inadvertently some of the early release days uh, that occur during the course of the school year. So we added those back in. Um, another change was on January 6th, which is celebrated as Three Kings Day. Um, there was a request um, to include that. That came actually from principals last year as well, um, because a significant number, particularly of staff members, uh, were taking the day off to celebrate, as, as is, they should. Um, and it, it actually was getting hard to staff the buildings. Um, so we wanted Holyoke, some other districts, uh, do have that day off um, for that. And, and we thought that was a good idea. Um, Juneteenth, which you knew because I've shared with you in June, uh, was a holiday that people were able to take off this year. And there was a request that it would be, um, even though it's a weekend this year, that it's um, it's explicitly listed that way. Um, and the last request was to move, push back some of the elementary early release days that are designed for parent conferences a little later, given the later start of the school year. Um, so they're now pushed back. Um, to uh, late October 30th and November 2nd. And again, all of those were great ideas. So I appreciate the APEA leadership sharing those with us in time to make those edits uh, and be able to present them for you. Uh, the, does, the Three Kings Day does push the last day of school to June 21st. Uh, please note that no snow days are included. And so all inclement weather days would be distance learning. Um, so uh, we can be confident that June 21st is the last day. Uh, it did come up uh, when we had the canceled meeting. What if there's a day with uh, no internet connections, if there's an electrical storm? Um, so there's, you know, what I find in the era of COVID is, you know, you peel the onion and you can never really get to the inside, right? It's, there continues to be layers. And so I think that is something that we will have to um, plan around that it, it really, if there's uh, power outages and, and widespread power outages, um, that don't allow for distance learning, we may have to come back to that question. Thankfully, there are fewer of those and there are snowy days, uh, especially in our towns of Shootsbury and Leverett, um, but also in Amherst and Pelham as well. Um, so, that, so we did make some edits, but it was based on feedback from our uh, association. Again, appreciate the feedback and uh, we, we tried to integrate in all of their pieces of feedback because um, we thought they were helpful. Um, I know that many families are looking forward to having a calendar. Um, and um, so that's, I think, what I have to share, and I'm open to any questions. Mr. Demling. Yes, uh, so thank you for this. Um, so one question on, on November 3rd and November 4th. So uh, November 3rd is going to be a busy day in the country. Hopefully the next day is a happy day for, for most of us. Um, but. Um, as, as those of us in Amherst uh, who are following recent events know, um, many people in town are going to be walking through our schools during election day with the polling. Uh, and obviously that's a, a safety issue in COVID times. So I won't, I won't, I won't attempt to summarize the entire town council um, discussion on it, but basically um, that's going to be happening. And so um, I, w I was, I'm curious what, what the, what the thinking is in terms of, um, uh, of November 4th, of the day after, right? So we have we have the third off as, as no one's in the building, no, no students in the building. Um, so that's when, when people are going to be using buildings as polling places. But um, I, I assume then that we'll want to do some level of cleaning prior to uh, want, having the students back in the building. So could you just walk us through what the, what the sure. plan is there and what level if, of involvement, if any, Town of Amherst has with that and what that yep. all means? So I'll have a little more information tomorrow morning. Mr. Roy Clark and myself are meeting with the town. Uh, but what I do know in the conversations we've had with the town over the last week, um, that's, that uh, voters would not be walking through the building. They would be um, using external entrances to enter the Crocker Farm Library, the Wildwood Gym, and the Fort River Gym. 
So those individual spaces would undergo significant um, hydrostatic cleaning uh, and would be off limits to staff the next day. Uh, we're not planning on using those spaces in those schools um, on, a, on a routine daily basis um, that couldn't be adjusted for. Um, they're, they're bringing in their own bathrooms that will be outside, you know, porta potty kind of things. Um, and they will be, the doors will be locked and there will be um, explicit um, support for the volunteers to not allow any voter to enter any space that is not, uh, and the high school gym the same, that is one, one of those three spaces. So we do feel at this point confident that we can have school in, class, in buildings the next day. Uh, we do not feel that those spaces would be suitable for students to enter into. And we may have to do some adjustments uh, because of that uh, for students and staff, I should say. So, you know, it could be the case that, um, you know, both PE and library, um, those staff would not be able to return to those rooms the next day because my quick sense is there'll be a lot of cleaning that night, but the thorough cleaning is going to occur the next day, as you know, on the 4th of November. Um, but since, since voters will not be entering the school building, uh, other than those spaces and the doors will be locked, um, I feel, and the constables will be there, I feel very confident that we can run school the next day with the adjustment for those individual spaces being off limits to students and staff. This is an adjustment particularly for those of you about Crocker Farm where voting used to be in the gym. There's no way to get to the gym at Crocker Farm without walking through the building and that's why uh, we've uh, slated it for the library at Crocker Farm so that it, there's an external entrance um, and exit and uh, it will not involve uh, visitors to the building, uh, being in the building, really just that one space. Any other questions on the calendar? Ms. Spitzer. So two things. I'll start off with a smaller thing. I think in the past, I think it was before, before COVID this year, we heard from a group of Jewish students who were concerned about um, recognizing the Jewish holidays in our calendar. And I realize this is a... Um, there are many, many different faiths in our schools, so it would be difficult to necessarily <clears throat> call it one, but I, I, I'm bringing it up because they did come to us and, and um, submitted comment about this. So could you do what we've done, if anything, to deal with those questions? I'm so glad you remembered that. Um, and and um, so really we should be shifting uh, that first early release date to the 28th, uh, which yeah. what it was originally, and I think in the transition to COVID calendar and other changes that got lost. So uh, that was in Yom Kippur, is that right? Uh, I believe I can check for it, but uh, one of the holidays I believe is on the weekend this year. Um, and one uh, is during, yeah. So Rosh Hashanah is on the weekend, Rosh Yom Kippur is on that. Yep. Um, and so uh, if the committee would um, allow for um, that to be an edit to this calendar, and I want to really appreciate Ms. Spitzer for recalling that conversation and commitment we made to students. And boy, does that feel like a while ago, but it's no less important um, that we do that now. So thank you. And, and so my other comment is, is sort of a big picture, kind of thinking outside the box thing that I'm not expecting to be resolved today. But I, I do think, it, you know, as somebody who's been reading almost everything I can about schools and things, I, for COVID, our calendar is a little backwards. Like, really, it would have been nice to have our kids in school all summer and then to have them home with us during the cold and flu season. Um, so that's one thought and, and something I've, I've been reading elsewhere. The other thing is that, you know, as somebody who I'm, I'm hoping my kids will be in person and in care, and I'm also really hoping I can spend the holidays with my family. So things like, you know, if, whether it's you know Thanksgiving or these other holidays, I can imagine that a lot of families are going to be really weighing: Do I keep my home, my kid home for two weeks so they can technically quarantine before we get together over the December break for holidays? And and so, I don't. I just want to plant the seed as something for us to think about, especially if this year proves. To, I'm, I'm really hoping we get a vaccine. But I'm a little worried we could be living in this new world for a while and thinking about the ways that we can potentially change the calendar so that we have more time in person when cold and flu are not around. And also thinking about if you know, now we kind of do the holiday up front and then you get a week to spend with your family. But what if we did that week ahead of time so people could quarantine at home, including our staff who are going to want to also see their family? Um, and then get to spend the holiday feeling more confident that they're not potentially um, impacting their loved ones. I don't know if anybody else has, I've been having these conversations with other parents about, about the holidays and what I'm gonna be doing. Um, so I just wanted to plant that seed and um, 
maybe we can talk about it later. Dr. Morris? I think we should talk about it now. Uh, you know, I'd yeah. love to have this voted tonight, to be honest with you. Um, I think it'd be a relief to families and staff to know what the schedule is going to be. <laughs> Um, I'm, I don't have strong feelings either way. And by that, I don't mean that I disagree with your comments, Ms. Spitzer. I, I mean, I truly can see both sides of that. I think the other side is that's a long break for some families who aren't going to be traveling. Um, it's a long time to not have access to adults in school. Um, and I think your point's really well taken in this era. I tend to agree with you. And my hopes for a vaccine, everything that I'm reading is, you know, people assume that, uh, some people assume that it's like a 98% polio style vaccine. Uh, I think there's no evidence that that is going to be likely, um, that if the vaccine comes, it's going to be hopefully better than the flu vaccine, but, you know, probably in between there and, and what we want it to be. Um, so I think we're going to be in this world for a long time. Um, sorry to be a downer, but that's all the science that I've read points in that direction. Um, so I'm very comfortable, it, you know, with, I think what your suggestion would be is that, um, that the 18th of December would be the last, um, last day, if I'm understanding you correctly um of school and then we'd return on the january 4th that would push us the school year going to the 24th of june um and i'm very comfortable with that i'm also comfortable staying with the course really whatever the committee is operationally um we'll be fine either way so it's really uh you know however the committee feels about it um we will make that work and um you know me if i have strong feelings i'll tell you but um i think i could uh, I, i'm very comfortable either either way on that I, I wonder if you could, instead of starting on the 18th, just add, if, if we wanted to do that, um, add the 4th and 5th of January. I know that's counter to what you just suggested, Ms. Spitzer, about having the break before the holiday, but if, we're, if what we're trying to get to is a two-week quarantine, it seems it would feel a little less disruptive if it was um, a contiguous two weeks that rather than coming back to school for two days and then have another holiday in there. So um, that it would still get us a two week um, break at that time frame. I'd be fine with that. And I, I'd also say like potentially I mean, this year we canceled a, a big chunk of spring break um, to shorten the school year so people could, I, I, because people weren't traveling. Who knows what the world will be in April? And and I'm also happy staying with this calendar, but I think for 2021, 22, if, if we're, you know, in January still in the same place, I think we may want to fundamentally think about how we're doing this. and. And that's part of, that was also part of the reason, not necessarily for changing this calendar, if people feel like it would be too disruptive for families who are dealing with so many changes, but to, to start, start that conversation even about next year now. Ms. Seeger? Yeah, I think that's a really good point about looking at the months and thinking that like the April break, April, May, and June are the perfect times to have the windows open and to be outside more. And so that I don't know if we want to think about that tonight, but definitely look at reevaluating April break, break at some point during the school year to see if it's better done earlier, a different time, but because those are going to be the times and it's probably best to. I, I think what we're trying to do is get to what's our default calendar right now and, and vote that. And obviously if if pandemic requires us to do things differently, we'll adjust in the same way that we adjusted this year. But I think what the superintendent is asking for from us tonight is to vote on what is our default calendar, assuming there's no other emergency closures or changes. So said another way, if, if we're thinking about the April vacation, that's something we need to be deciding now. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of, kind of add on and just add a little bit of different perspective in terms of uh, lengthening the. So I'm I'm in full agreement with the idea of kind of uh, extending that winter break up or well the uh, holiday break a bit. I'm not I'm not sure which side I, I lean more towards, but that's like it's kind of like a reset and retooling time for the facilities department. And, and I think all things considered, that that having that extra little buffer time, I think it, it benefits everyone involved you, you get to you know my, my son who hasn't seen his grandmother for forever will get to 
have that time and, and so will some staff and, and uh, other students. But then, then also being able to reassess where we're at right then and you know, actually get some, some progress done during that period, I think would be beneficial as well. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so just, so just to clarify uh, what we're talking about here. So is the, is the McDonald proposal, for lack of a better term, um, adding January 4th and January 5th as, hall, as, um, uh, um, as break days, as, as non-school days, in which, in which case the last day of school bumps out two days? Is that the is that the variant, and then and then the other variant, and then the first variant that Ms. Spitzer proposed was um, uh, adding the twenty December twenty first, twenty second, and twenty third. Is that the okay? Um, yeah, I mean, if if Dr. Morris is truly a hundred percent agnostic on the educational impact, then I guess I'm fine either way. I I guess I do like that the. Um, the fourth and fifth a little better um, because it it keeps the 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 natural academic wrap well, I guess academic wrap up is a relative term at the high school when your finals are are later in January. Um, I say that mid comment. Um, yeah, I, I I guess I'm I'm not feeling strong more uh, stronger either way. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess the strongest feeling I'm feeling is that I want to vote a calendar tonight. And so um, if, if there are members of the committee that are have compelling reasons one way or the other, I'm, I'm more than happy to hear them and uh, so that we can decide one way or the other. Um, it, it does seem like when you add the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, I'm just looking at the grid right now, um, that when, not, when that then connects to the weekend, you get a whole lot of days in a row. Again, when kids are out of out of school and and you know um, not connecting with the teachers that, that does seem a little long so I, I guess I guess I have a small preference as I'm thinking out loud for January fourth and fifth but again it's not a strong preference at the, at the moment. Dr. Morris, actually I just wanted to see if Ms. Gribko. I'm really curious about the student experience and and as you don't have to comment but you know given the the three options one is the one that the schedule as as listed the second would be uh fourth fifth and sixth and the other one would be starting uh you know with the 21st 22nd and 23rd um you're probably the expert right now on what would feel uh better uh both as a student but also as someone who might want to see her family and uh during that time i don't and again not to put you on the spot but i seem to be the person who does that sometimes but i i'm just i only do that because i'm curious about your opinion if you're willing to share it yeah so i think um having I mean, in my opinion, I think having time before the holidays is, makes sense. Um, but I think as listed, it's fine. I think it, it's um, something that people can sort of agree on and it still gives time to people. So I guess that's my comment. <laughs> I guess one of the things that I, I struggle with is, is the concept of quarantining so that folks can visit family or, or or travel, because in theory, if you're if you're visiting somebody, you should be quarantining for two weeks before you see them, and then if you've gone someplace else, you need to quarantine when you for two weeks when you come back. So I'm not sure how we're addressing that by tacking on a few days, whether it's before the holiday or after the holiday, just because. In either scenario, you don't really have a full two weeks to quarantine, and we certainly don't want to be encouraging people to travel um, over any of the break of any length and then come right back to school on the fourth um, without without quarantining after traveling. I mean, it's assuming that we still have the same travel restrictions that we have today. Um, so I, I guess I'm a little torn, to be honest. I'm not sure if we're really accomplishing what we're what we're trying to um, at that point. And the question of how many people would really be able to travel um, from that perspective. Um, Ms. Spitzer. But I'm not even considering like um, traveling. I mean, it's just like, even if your family lives within the same town as you, you may cut off connections with them. It, it, I mean, now you can socially distance, you can be outside and you can wave, but in the middle of December, 
it's going to be a lot harder to have a socially distanced visit with with a loved one, even if they live within your same community. Um, and the other thing that we could do to address this, uh, well, and, and then there's this issue of like the airflow and we're encouraging, you know, classrooms right now to be outside, to open windows. I'm just thinking December is going to be a hard month for, for us to do that. Um, so adding, if we took time from warmer months and put it, you know, breaks in warmer months to the colder months, I could see the advantage, not necessarily about the quarantining, but there's just improving the likelihood that people are gonna be able to actually get in-person instruction. Um, the other argument I'd make in favor of it um, would just be that, or not another argument, but another way we could achieve the same goal that wouldn't affect the calendar would be potentially going virtual for some of those days. But I, I think it's hard to argue that when we're in November, you know, just gonna be bringing back some of our students. Um, to then be putting them back into virtual after just bringing them back. So anyway, I, this is why it's important to have a conversation about it. it's complicated. Ms. Hall. So actually, I just have a really quick procedural question that I should probably know. This is, I mean, I understand that I can share my opinions. I feel kind of fine either way. The, but this is strictly a region vote, right? This is not, doesn't the vote of the calendar just sit squarely with the region? Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. And I feel like I could go either way. It's hard for me. Time has no meaning anymore. I can't even think about December, so I can't even formulate an opinion, but just wanted to confirm who was voting. Any other comments, questions, Ms. Seeger? So I, I feel really, um, I, I think it's really hard for me to, to, to think through this right now. Um, and I'm just gonna toss out an idea of saying, like, what if there wasn't the April break? Um, last year in the spring, we, uh, at least in Leverett, I think we canceled a few days of it and had a couple of days of it, but people really just wanted to keep going. They felt like they finally got the, their, um, their routine uh, happening and, and remote schooling working for them. So I just wonder if that's going to be the similar way. And if we didn't have that week, those days could go into covering December 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, as well as the 4th and 5th of January. Um, that being said, I, I, I am just, I, I still feel like that's even a crazy idea because educators, by the time they get to April, they probably want that break. Families want that break. So I, I feel like there aren't a whole lot of good options here, especially considering just having a few days leading up to the holidays in December, like uh, Ms. McDonald mentioned, there's not a whole lot of time to quarantine there. And so if you had a longer time, then, then people could actually quarantine, maybe travel a little bit and see their families. But then it's a lot of time for the students to be away from the schools, so that just feels like there's, I, I'm really confused on what to do and there's like no good answer here. Dr. Morris. Yep, so a couple of things. One is that the regional school committee has a policy that uh, we have vacations in February and April. So I think if you really wanna go down that road, you'd have to suspend the current policy that you have. The second thing is, um, I just also wanna caution us that everything we heard from medical professionals yesterday is we're not really trying to encourage travel, particularly to areas at that given time. Uh, maybe hotspots, quarantine or not, that is, um, we, we can't control what people do, but there may be a 14 day, we don't know what life will be like in December. There may be a 14 day quarantine if you're returning from the state of whatever. I'm not going to pick one because then someone gets mad at me, but um, it, could be <laughs> it could be from when you leave the 413, right? And you enter the 508, there may be a quarantine period. So I think there, there, there's a lot of variables here. I think the idea of having a little bit longer winter break and adding days in June where it's more possible to be outside, I think that's a sound principle regardless, uh, given the situation we're in. And, and, you know, and I'm comfortable going either way, but I'm supportive of extending that break because I do think you know, it just will make a whole lot of sense uh, when we get there. Um, so you know, I am supportive. Uh, I don't have a strong preference either way about you know, adding days before or adding days afterwards. Um, it will push the end of the school year to be a little later, but I think that's okay. And actually, frankly, for many of our students, having a longer break then and then a shorter summer break is actually a really good thing. 
um, you know, that the, if you look at research about uh, when the um, achievement gap or opportunity gap grows the most, it's summer months. It's very low growth during the school year and significant growth in the summer. So uh, I'm all for that. I'm now turned over. I'm not neutral. Um, I don't have a, I don't want to make a decision for the committee, but I think, I think, you know, hearing the conversation, it makes sense. Uh, whether it's before or after um, makes little, uh, has little impact for me. Um, if I had to make a suggestion, I probably would make it longer before. Um, and um, I think that's because I'm not worried about having disruption a little when we come back and having a four day week. I actually kind of like four day weeks after a long break. I think that there's a nice flow to that. And the reason why we don't like having five day weeks to start the year and, and after a long break, I think that makes sense. So I guess my slight preference would be uh, start having the 18th of December be the last day of school and having that long break. It does push us, you know, kind of late in June. But again, I think there's some upsides to that as well. Um, so uh, the conversation generated an opinion for me. That's the way it's supposed to go. So if you go with a different opinion, I'm totally fine. I'll make it work. We'll make it work regardless. But that's where I am at the moment. Mr. Manning, you had your hand raised. I support uh, Professor Morris's uh, non-neutral suggestion. <laughs> Is that, a, is that a motion, Mr. Menino? Yes, it is a motion. I move that we extend the holiday break and add a couple of days to the end of the year. I guess that's the sense of the motion. And approve the calendar? Um, oh, to approve the calendar, definitely. So uh, I said another, uh, we move to a, a Mr. Menino has moved to approve the calendar with the addition of uh, the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of December as holidays and adding the appropriate number of days on the, the end of the year. I'll second that. Is that Ms. Seeger? Mm -hmm. Yep. Moved uh, by Menino, second by Seeger. I'm seeing some discussion, so I'll start. I saw Mr. Harrington's hand first, then Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to ask which part of the extended uh, holiday break we wanted, and then he, it, it was clarified, so I'm good. Okay, Mr. Demling? Um, so did we get that, I'm, I'm losing track now, did, did we get that change to the uh, Yom Kippur um, day in uh, September as well? Would, would Mr. Menino accept that as a friendly amendment to the motion? Yes, overall? yes. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer? That was my comment as well. Thank you. Ms. Seeger? So what then would be the official end of the year with this holidays and the extended break? It would be the 24th of June. Okay. Okay. All right, one comment. Yes, Ms. Stancer. Uh, I just wanted an observation that that week, first week in January, Wednesday is a, going to be a holiday this year too. So there will be just just an observation. That's the Three Kings Day that's been added as a vacation day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll take a, um, a roll call vote of the region only. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. Um, the motion passes nine to zero. Thank you. And now um, we will move to the next item, which is discussion about outreach with the community, the virtual town halls. Um, and I saw a, a slew of, of, of notices and schedules. So um, Dr. Morris, maybe you could update us on what's been scheduled so far. Sure, I just wanna go back. I think I mentioned the superintendent update, but I wanna thank the committee. Many of the committee members were able to make it to a um, event last Saturday on East Hadley Road. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I don't know how you all felt. I really enjoyed being it. It was an in-person event. Uh, I want to thank the community, um, South Point, the management company for welcoming not just people at South Point, but a number of different um, housing areas uh, all along East Hadley Road. We had a really nice turnout. Uh, I'll reference some of the feedback we received um, actually two times in an upcoming presentation. 
is really impactful to me. We're doing the same kind of event on Saturday. Um, it's for Olympia Oaks and Village Park uh, families. Um, and again, because of COVID and other things, we're asking just for the families who live in those two areas to be able to come. It's at 10 o'clock. All of you are welcome to come if you like. It's on the Olympia, o Olympia Oaks side uh, of that, which um, if anyone has questions, just let me know and I'll get to the right place. Um, but uh, really, really enjoyed that. And, and again, the dialogue I found really helpful. Um, we're doing virtual town halls on Monday. Uh, nine o'clock is the secondary, nine to 10, uh, and four to five at the elementary. These uh, was emailed out, they're on YouTube, so people can ask live questions. We'll have a brief slide deck uh, that we'll share out. We're also gonna do a narration of that slide deck in four other languages and send it out to the families who identify that as their primary language. Um, like like I mentioned before, for those uh, live town halls, we'll also have Google Meet information so people can follow live and ask questions through the interpreter uh, in their language who do the translation and type it in. Um, so we're looking forward to those. Um, and that's, I think, the next couple of days of, uh, of engagement uh, for us uh, on that matter, uh, on, the, on the return to school matter. Um, I'll, I can answer any questions that anyone would have. Mr. Denley? Uh, so we've had some feedback on the previous and now these about um, possibility of scheduling some town halls outside of work hours. Can can you comment on that possibility? Yeah, so I think one of the things that that that's difficult about that is that we want to have a broad representation. So for instance, all of our principals are participating, uh, our nurse manager, perhaps our facilities director. And so it gets a little hard to schedule everyone's uh, time at those times, but the um, sessions are recorded. Uh, and if people do have questions beforehand that they want to make sure we answer, they can certainly send them to me at morrism.arps.org. Um, and we're, we're happy to include those in the conversation on Monday um, for that. But, uh, you know, if you follow that link, like all of our other YouTube ones, that link stays live indefinitely. And so uh, people can track along, they can ask questions, make sure they're answered. Um, you know, by emailing me and we'll integrate them as best we can into the presentation. Any other questions? Mr. Denling. So as, as the information overload train um, speeds along and parents get kind of inundated, you know, we're going to have a lot of different information sources, which is great, FAQ and forums and emails. If, if a parent is going along and then has like a specific detailed question, right, between now and the start of school, what, what's what's the best source for them to, to, to contact? You know, we, we don't want them contacting the school committee for everything. And you know, we don't want them contacting the superintendent for everything. So like, where where, where ought they to go? What, what, what should we recommend? Yeah, I think in this situation, the first place is always a building principal. Um, sometimes if they're concerned that it's more of a district-wide issue, they can, you know, CC that building principal or CC me. Uh, and we can direct that. I think we've been uh, reasonably good at responding to questions um, or comments that we receive by the information flow getting managed. Uh, Mr. Smola and Ms. Figaro in particular are really good at figuring out where questions need to go and um, making sure they get to the right place. But uh, I think for most people, the, the person they know the best, um, with the exception of the incoming kindergartners and maybe preschoolers, is their principal. And, and even if it's a question that ends up getting routed uh, elsewhere, I think starting in that place um, typically makes the most sense. Any other questions? No? Okay. Moving on, um, we'll now move to the next item, which is public health metrics for opening and phasing models. Sure. Over to you, Dr. Norris. Sure, so we started this conversation last week. Since last week, we've done a significant amount of research into what other states and communities are doing. Uh, since last week, the state has also come out with their own metrics, which um, uh, I'll, I'll describe why I find their metrics um, not particularly helpful for our needs in a, in a little bit. Um, but we have some significant changes um, that of uh, what I believe should be our metrics for opening school and phasing since we since we talked about this last week. So I'll start by sharing a slide deck. Um, give me one quick second to get that going. Um, okay. Ooh. It's on the, not on the first slide. All right, is that visible to folks? Okay. So um, I want to thank the folks in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we did not actually end up going with the same metrics they did. 
but we did borrow a lot of their language um, and you know whoever's their graphics person did a fabulous job so uh, we want to I want to publicly thank them and thank them for their work and um, their use of that so really you know starting from even last night's conversation there are medical risk factors and ways to reduce risk and you know people with underlying health conditions encourage support to stay at home of course health procedures and, and I think the the medical professionals were great in talking about this that face coverings ventilation like our purifiers, making sure classrooms have windows, all those types of things, uh, hand washing, hand sanitizing, those are really critical um, and uh, they contribute to the overall number staying low and they're really critical. Uh, our approach actually, frankly, much like Cambridge, um, we have uh, similar models, um, have younger students coming back first along with students of the highest needs um, and also that the density in classrooms and school buildings um, is significantly reduced. And we talked about de-densifying a lot and, and that really matters for, for air quality and all the other things. You know, we want to monitor the community conditions. I think one of the things we heard last night, which I think was spot on, is if community transmission rate is low, school transmission rate will be low. If community transmission rate is high, school transmission rate will be high. That schools aren't in and of itself unrelated to the community. They are part of the community and they're a place where if the community metrics and health is, is going well, it's highly likely that school will and vice versa. Uh, and that, that's proven true in many, many areas. So I think we're seeing some really negative examples um, in Southern states that have started with have really high community transmission rates. And it's not surprising that the school transmission rates have been problematic. And, and the same thing would be true here if our rates were the same. Um, um, and I think the last point I want to say here, it was completely borrowed from Cambridge, but um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that for some children, there are heavy risks associated with being at home and in making decisions, we must balance those risks. I thought that was a really uh, helpful comment that I am happy to credit in Cambridge and, and, and steal from them. So uh, for when we get to metrics, we did more analysis of other states and other places. I want to note that we intentionally did not include metrics that we wouldn't agree with. So for instance, states like Oklahoma have metrics of when you would need to wear a mask in school. We didn't include that because that's not, you know, it's no disrespect to, to the state of Oklahoma, but that's not something we would implement here. It goes against all of the recommendation that received from national organizations. So uh, we really only pick the metrics uh, that we felt like were helpful in describing it. If we wanted to make our metrics look like really different than them, we could have, because uh, some of the metrics that have come up in other states um, are wildly different than what we would consider here. New York State has a 5% testing rate in the region um, and a 14 day average. And if it goes to greater than 9%, even in a seven day, they have to close. Um, CDC, World Health Organization also both have 5% and there's citations to that. Uh, New York City, because of their density, has described that 3% positive testing rate in the city would be their average. They feel like because of the high population density in the city, they need to go lower than the state average. I think it's worth noting that both for the state and New York City, um, they're talking about regions. So New York City in itself, uh, having grown up, actually been born in New York City, it's a region into itself. There's 8 million people who live there. Um, and in New York State, they're talking about regions. And I've seen that a lot. Uh, I think one of my critiques, and the Somerville mayor talked about it, this uh, last night is that when you look at town by town, unless you're talking about large urban areas, uh, just, and I don't mean to be flip about it, but our borders are porous. Uh, from where I live, I can walk to three towns. Uh, if I'm really in feeling motivated, I can run to another town that's in a different county. And so when we think about town by town numbers, um, they really aren't as helpful as we look at the communities and the region. And so we, 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 did, we are looking at Hampshire and Franklin County um, as our numbers, and we'll get into the kind of the weeds on that in a little bit. But, you know, if you look at the statewide map, and again, I'm not trying to pick on Governor Baker or whoever put that together, you know, more than half the communities are in white on their map. And if you've seen that map, white means that the population is too low to come to any conclusions based on cases. Um, that's not, for me, very helpful as a guiding metric. Uh, three of our towns fit in that category, that they will be white forever, um, you know, on that map. And then that white is something that doesn't change because it's too small for the, the metrics to use. So, you know, I think having a regional approach is what I've seen in other states, and I think it makes sense to me. So I do appreciate the work of the state. I just don't find it helpful. Um, Harvard Growth Institute, Harvard, excuse me, Global Health Institute recently came out with a report that talked about 3% positive testing in the area or the region, and one to two, seven, one to 10 new cases daily, which works out to seven to 70 new cases per week per 100,000. Connecticut used that same metric, uh, which is uh, less than 70 cases new week per 100,000. They also have a metric around uh, growth or increase in cases, although it's not as finite as I'd like it to be personally. 
uh, Cambridge, uh, again, no, no disrespect to Cambridge, they came up with a lot of the slides, but um, they have a, a need two, two out of three to open, a 5% testing rate, um, then uh, less than 25 cases per day. Uh, for us, we're looking at per week, so that'd be 150 new cases per week. Um, and um, and then 100,000 people and uh, per 100,000 people, and then the sewage wastewater monitoring, which you know I'm not going to get into here. Um, I think Cambridge also is using a two-county model, or I know Cambridge is also using a two-county model, Middlesex and one of the other ones, which I uh, Suffolk perhaps, but I'm I'm not so good at my counties in Eastern Massachusetts, so I apologize. But they have a very similar approach where Cambridge is a much larger community, and they recognize that people. Um, not every, Cambridge is really between two counties or near two counties, and uh, that regional approach seemed to make sense to them. So what uh, what I feel like is is appropriate for us is to look at fewer than 70 new cases per 100,000 in Hampshire and Franklin, and Franklin, and and waiting um, 0.7 for Hampshire and 0.3 for Franklin County based on their relative populations. Two of our four towns, half of our four towns, are in Franklin County in the region. Uh, and the other two border Franklin County. So I do think Franklin County should be considered in this. And also less than 3% percent positive rate. Uh, again, um, that one it's, doesn't need waiting. It's basically what I've done. And Representative Dom is trying to help us with this, but uh, I add up all 46 towns and cities in Franklin County, count, Frank, Hampshire and Franklin County every Wednesday night. And I just do percent positives in each town and then divide. So there's no preset metric. I will tell you that there are more tests taken in Hampshire County than there are in Franklin County. So it's sort of, the metrics sort of adjust for population naturally. Uh, and I wanna note that really the approach we've taken and you all have been leaders on this is we look at what's being recommended and we choose the most conservative option. So in other words, the, all those agencies, 5%, 3%, 9% positives. And, and in every case, we've chosen the most conservative estimate that's being recommended by reputable organizations. And I feel like this should be no different. Um, so that's sort of the approach that uh, I would recommend. Uh, when I pause there, I saw there was a hand up. Um, I got more to get through on this, but um, see if there's a question at this point. Mr. Menino. I think you addressed this. Now, when are these metrics available? On a Monday, Wednesday, that type of thing? Is it once a week? Sure. So the, um, why don't I, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that in two more slides. Um, okay. That's okay. Um, yep. So the phasing piece, um, you know, I think we keep the same numbers for the phases. That's some feedback I, I received is why would there be different metrics for different phases? And I think that's true. I think the only metric we add is, you know, if there was an increase from prior week's data, we might stay in a phase. It still might be under our other metrics, but we might not want to add students until we see whether that was a, a blip or something where we're actually headed in the opposite direction. Um, and I, you know, I did some math on it. There's no perfect way to do it because our numbers, frankly, are so low at the net, at the moment. If you, it's hard to plot to plot all this out. Uh, but it looked like if they went up more than 33% uh, in any period, whether seven or 14 days, that would be a cause of concern. Uh, I'll show you our current numbers on the next slide. You'll see that mathematically, you know, you need more than a 33% increase to actually get to the metrics from where we are right now. To, to get above the limits. Um, so, but I felt like there, that's a pretty big increase, even as a percentage. Um, when I do one more slide and then open up for questions, if it's okay, Ms. McDonald and Ms. Hall. Um, so to get to Mr. Menino's point, um, for 70 cases, less than 70 new cases per week per 100,000, that's updated every day. And if you click on this link, which I won't, um, you know, but you can, it links you to a New York Times, uh, uh, which updates daily a number of new cases per county across the country. So for instance, today or yesterday, I think last night when I checked, Hampshire County was at, still at 24, Franklin County was down to seven uh, per 100,000 people. So if I had updated this last night, this metric, it would be like, instead of 19.5, I think it ended up you know, closer to 19.0, but not really there, it was like 19.3 or four or something like that. Uh, that updates every day. The second one, the percent positive tests, uh, that is, um, that data file is produced every Wednesday evening by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So you do have to wait. Uh, you can't do that daily. You could see that uh, last week's data was 1.3% for all towns combined. Uh, last night, we found that it was down to 1.1% uh, for Hampshire and Franklin County. So uh, the, the, the top one is a little more, is updated more daily, and that's a little easier to track that way. Well, it's easy to track, you just have to do one click. Uh, the bottom one takes, uh, you know, what is now a PDF of an Excel file. I just wish they would just make it an Excel file for us. Uh, then it would be easier or just give us county by county data. But we do add them up for the 46 cities and towns in Hampshire and Franklin County. And we do the averaging on an Excel file. 
Um, and, you know, for, so at this point, we're well below both metrics. Um, we're less than half of both metrics, even the conservative metrics we're using. Um, and I'll, I'll pause for comments or questions. There, there is a little more to the end of the slides, but. Mr. Menino. What happens if the metrics are exceeded? Do we go to distance learning or cease the uh, phase in status? So uh, if we, either of these two metrics, if we, any of, either of them went over the limit, we would move to distance learning. Mr. Denley. So kind of follow up on Mr. Menino's uh, question. So I think it was Mr. Menino and maybe Ms. Kenny that brought up the, uh, you know, the, the rapid switch problem, right? So what happens if you're kind of on the, you're on the threshold, you trigger once, and then and then that metric is going above and you know so have you thought through a little bit more of of you know practical implementation what what would we do in the scenario where we've you've crested the threshold you've you've switched modes and then do you do you sort you stay in that mode for a, a defined period before reassessing yeah so i mean the way i was kind of loosely thinking about it is two weeks seems like the right span just given um that the data is often 14 day data um and it seemed like if it gets better, you know, you're, you're starting to get two weeks old data out of your system, right? Um, and, and it also felt just practically that felt like doable from a teaching and learning perspective that if we're doing one week and you're finding out on a Wednesday, uh, particularly if it's a second metric, you know, do we send a connect ed message or school messenger thing on Wednesday night saying we're having school? Um, it felt like the right grain size of time to say, we're going to pause, we're going to see how this data tracks. Um, so that's sort of where we landed. Now, I can't say two weeks exactly, because if it's, it depends which data source it is. The one that updates daily, you can, you know, make that sort of assumption, because you can update it all the time. The second data source, unless it's up, to, unless the state changes its methods, um, we only get that data on a Wednesday. So, you know, I think two weeks is a general time frame because it sort of depends on which metric. But that seemed like the right amount of time to uh, reassess and make sure teachers aren't uh, and students aren't feeling whiplash from being back and forth. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer. So I guess I'm wondering if there's anybody else in the town who's actively doing this tracking. And just, uh, so I think it's really, I, I like the way you're going with the metrics and that we're going down to we're not kind of changing the rate based on phase. I, I like that. I like that we're going conservative and, and kind of keeping with what the most conservative guidance is. So I am really supportive of that. But I'm curious about like, <laughs> I wish there were more robust, I guess this is just a frustration with both the state and the federal government. And I'm really wishing it wasn't on each and every school committee to, to be in charge of this. I, I feel like the way you're shaking your head, you share that sentiment. Um, and so I guess my other question, one other thing I'd like to point out is I think that they actually make the raw data available because the other day when I was looking at these slides, so I think you can, I downloaded an Excel file with the test for each. So just as an FYI to save you some time going from PDF to, uh, we can talk offline and I can show you how, how I was able to download the Excel file. Um, but then I guess my, my other qu question is just to raise an issue with positivity test rates is that it kind of depends on how much testing we're doing. So like, I, I think it's good that we pair them, but I'm wondering if there's a minimum threshold of testing that needs to be being done in order, because if we move back to, I, I don't think there's any indication that this is going to happen. But again, because things change all the time and they're not always changing the direction we want. If, if testing suddenly becomes as limited as, as it is in some other states, we could be see the positivity test rate go up artificially, even though if the cases per 100,000 people stay low. And the opposite could happen. So one of the things I was thinking about, like, if, if we suddenly get all of this, um, asympt if we suddenly have an explosion in asymptomatic testing, I think we could see the positivity test rate go down artificially because we're doing, like, say we start testing every college student or every, um, you know, student in any of the schools in the community, we're going to see a potentially an increase in the lower. So that, anyways, I just wanted to raise that and wonder if you thought at all about what we do if there was a change in, in how much testing is going on in the community, because I think that matters. Well, there is, and there will be a change. You know, for instance, Amherst College is testing students twice a week, um, and that that's starting in 
11 days and it's asymptomatic testing. And, and it does bring up a, a challenge for us. I did talk to a, a physician um, out of Brigham and Women's about that because um, they have similar issues going on in that part of the state as well. And he, he, he sort of referenced, it's good to have the two data points. You're gonna get some, some odd data because right now um, testing has been relatively constant. I know there's kind of slight downward trend, uh, you know, in our area of testing. And, and what we heard last night is that, you know, more testing is going to be available by the end of the month. Um, but we're, we're still in pretty, we're in, relative to the rest of the country. We're in fantastic shape in terms of availability as well as turnaround time. Um, so I think it is something to keep a track of. And that's, again, where the recommendations I received from both locally, but also from the eastern part of the state is if you do a regional test, it, it it's a much more accurate, it, it will be less sensitive to swings that might hit one community or another. Uh, we are one of those communities that's likely hit a swing where we may end up, to your point, the prediction this person made is we'll, our positivity rate will go down, but our numbers will go, our um, numbers per 100,000 will go up because if you're testing lots of people, your testing capacity is so high uh, that it'll have a, a inverse relationship or it could have an inverse relationship. And, and I think, again, having a regional approach really helps with that so that the swings aren't as dramatic because um, the data is going to be testing both apples and oranges, to use that cliche, uh, together when it's primarily been testing apples this whole time. Does that help, Ms. Spitzer? Okay. Mr. Menino. Is there a single definition of positivity rate? The reason I ask is I listened to that medical panel you had, I forget, yesterday, and one doctor suggested that it was asymptomatic people that didn't include symptomatic people. Yeah. So, um, so what happens now, for instance, um, is um, in our area, someone, and I think I, uh, yeah, let me just say it this way. So someone goes to the doctor and they have a stomach bug. A stomach bug is not necessarily symptomatic of COVID, right? It's not necessarily on the list of the long, it's a long list of things, but if someone has a stomach bug, no fever, no other symptoms. Um, so in certain parts of the country, that person wouldn't get tested for COVID because testing is not in, in supply to be able to do that. We happen to fortunately live in an area where um, p primary care providers are saying, well, it's probably not, but why don't you go get tested? And so people are getting tested even they're, though they're technically asymptomatic. In other words, they don't have many, if any, of the list. They may have something unrelated. And so I think that's the piece that we want to keep an eye on is what's, how many people, are, are we able to maintain that asymptomatic test so that people uh, are getting tested because what we, you know, what we don't know about COVID is, you know, let me say it differently, that's a good thing. We are a healthier community because people who are, are asymptomatic are able to get a test and get results within 24 hours. And so if that changes, our numbers will change along with it. And so we want to maintain that our community, the capacity of our community to respond to asymptomatic cases remains sufficient. Um, and, and so when we talk about asymptomatic, it's not just like, oh, I want to get a test for some reason, it's actually uh, oftentimes in our area, asymptomatic tests have been given because there's, um, or there's potential exposure. I was with someone, they're concerned that they have COVID, they haven't come back positive, can I get a test? And that's a really critical question when you think about community spread, right? And in, in many areas of the country, the answer, that, the answer to that question is no. You know, and I'm not saying, I can't speak for every individual in Western Mass, but I've had enough stories and talked to enough providers where they've been able to uh, access testing for people who are not yet showing signs of COVID. And that's one of the key factors of keeping communities safe. So the significance of a positivity test can differ across jurisdictions. Well, I think we're seeing, I mean, if you look at positivity tests in different states, they're wildly high. And okay. some of that isn't just because there's more COVID, some of it is. But some of that's because the only people who can get a test have to show so many symptoms even okay. to get a test that, you know, you see, I mean, I've seen, you know, areas where it's over 20%, right? So we're talking about three or 5%. They're over 20%. And it's, yes, they've got community spread problems. But one of the problems they have is you have to click many, check many boxes to get a prescription, to get a COVID test. And, and so when you're going to get a COVID test, you're much more likely to have COVID than here where again, the VAT 90, right now, 98.9% .9 of people in Hampshire and Franklin County are not getting, they're not COVID. It's not because all those people have symptoms. They're getting tested because of other factors that make them think it's a good idea to get tested. Sorry to be long-winded about it, but this no, is a really important point. 
Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I don't mean to muddy the water here, but here we go. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of thinking about like school choice students, but even more so like staff that live outside of Hampshire and Franklin County. How do, how do they factor into to all of this? Because um, like, I, I realized that recently that, that most of the staff that I work with, well, not most, I'd say a significant portion of them actually don't live here. And I think the same goes for our teaching staff as well. Yeah, so the majority of our staff writ large does live in Hampshire or Franklin County. Um, it may not be true in, in certain segments of our staff, but in general, they do live in one of those two counties. But you're right, we have uh, Worcester County, we have um, Hamden County, uh, Berkshire County, and I don't know right now, but we used to have Southern New Hampshire and Southern Vermont uh, staff who lived in there as well, as well as Northern Connecticut. Um, so, you know, for me, it's not muddying the water at all. I think uh, at some point, you know, I was trying to make a decision uh, about where the majority of our students live, the vast majority of our students and the majority of our staff. You know, we, we have many more students than we have staff members. And so to calculate, I did try to think about how could you calculate our, our ratio for all the people who might be in school and my head started spinning and uh, it started getting to the point of looking municipality by municipality um, to be a task that, that seemed um, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't yield much different results um, than what we have now. You're absolutely right that we do have staff members who live in other counties than those two. But if you look at all the students and all the staff, uh, the vast majority of students and the majority of staff live in one of those two places. And so, you know, as I talked to Cambridge is another good example and did connect uh, with somebody connected to there. And, and they have the same thing, even more so than where we are. I mean, Cambridge, people commute to Cambridge from, from Amherst frankly, um, as well as, I mean, we're on the outer edge, but I know people who commute to Cambridge who live in, in this particular community. And so the best medical advice I got is trying to get the bulk of where um, the people live who are in the community um, and knowing that you're not gonna be, it's not gonna be a perfect one-to-one -one of every single town or every single county. Um, it, it's intended to be a gross measure. To the larger point you're making, I think we do have to keep an eye on surrounding communities as well. You know, that, that I think, you're 100% right. I think the mathematical one uh, sort of started breaking down when you when you get into the weeds of it. Um, but on the larger picture, making sure that we're aware of, uh, particularly Worcester County, Berkshire County, and Frank and uh, Hamden County as being the three uh, next largest. But but even looking at the staffing roster, because um, the, the the lion's share do live up in in Franklin or Hamden Hampshire County, excuse me. But um, it's definitely something we're thinking about, and appreciate the the comment and feedback. Mr. Demley. I just want to say briefly that I, I appreciate the lining up all of the uh, regional and national approaches and taking the most conservative um, and then taking it a step further in terms of robustness, regardless of what the state is is recommending. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I've been really critical of the state and I, I continue to feel like they're, uh, I continue to feel critical of their approach. Um, I, I thought the one silver lining of, of what they talked about this week is, this week is at least they they brought the idea to the public consciousness that you ought to be focusing on local conditions, that that, that ought to be front and center um, about, uh, about, about this in the school reopening conversation, right? And um, I think they, they kind, it's, I think it's really late <laughs> in, their, in their support of local school districts. I think it's really oversimplified um, uh, for the reasons, that you, uh, reasons you mentioned. It's, it's literally not applicable to our regional school districts, like that they have no way and, and, and I'm, this isn't a criticism, like they're, they're up front and center that they have no way of applying it to the 58 regional school districts in the Commonwealth. And they told us that we're going to have to wait a few weeks on that. So um, so I, I, I like that we're being more conservative. I like that we're being more robust. Um, you know, I share the frustration that Ms. Spitzer um, uh, commented on earlier that, you know, it, it shouldn't be the role of superintendents and school committees to be identifying these things. But But here we are. But you know, this is the responsibility we have, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just grateful that we started these conversations in May, and in June. You know, I don't think had we been like a lot of districts that really started looking at the fall in July, uh, that we would have gotten to this point nearly at all. So, um, and I'm also thankful to our community. I mean, you know, you, you talked about how um, the school um, uh, spread, uh, the school um, COVID situation is directly uh, uh, affected by the community situation. And uh, we have the community to thank for for the current 
um, for the for the current numbers, you know, um, and, and that's that's all about compliance and behavior and social distancing and masks and um, you know and and hopefully that continues. Um, but you know, but it's that's that's really the group effort that we have to to thank people for um, that's, that's making this possible. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out because it's it's a big big variable in this equation. I apologize, Miss um, Miss Lord. You had your hand up earlier, and I skipped over you. Did you want to speak? Well, I was actually going to just I was going to mention about what Mr. Harrington was um, he brought up, and then I this might get tricky, but two of our I know a few employees that live between Granby and Holyoke for the Amherst district, and now they're in the red. Do we think about provisions for staff that are coming from? Red zones. I yeah, know. I mean, sorry, I, I'm going to be. Uh, it's not about your question, Miss Lord, but I want to respond. So, you know, there was a town in in um, Franklin County that was in the red last week because it went from they had two cases, and they had a percent positive testing rating that went from zero to seven percent, and then a week later, now they're back to zero, and the you know I don't know who the two cases are. Obviously, that's confidential, and I wouldn't have access. But it might be two siblings or a you know a set of partners so you know respectfully you know um to the state as well as to your question when we when we put labels on relatively small municipalities i have a really hard time right so i can walk to belchtown belchtown last week was high now it's low i felt just as safe on my run when i crossed this border that said welcome to belchertown as i did as when i said to amherst because you know people in western massachusetts as well as elsewhere people don't all work where they live and live where they work um, you know, the majority of our staff do not live in the town of Amherst uh, or the towns of Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury. And so for me, um, we have to be aware of that if there was a huge spike, of course. Um, but when we're talking about relatively small communities, um, these numbers and raw numbers are really small. And I really question, you know, bluntly, the statistical significance. When we talk about small communities and we talk about, you know, um, putting labels on them, um, I, have, I struggle because I... I I don't think, again, our borders are porous, uh, intentionally so. And so, I, and part of it, maybe you'll, you'll forgive me, I'm from New York, which is a very county-based system, because I think the county-wide systems uh, account for the fact that um, towns are really small. And so I, I struggle with why we have a map that has two-thirds of, as I said, two-thirds of towns don't even count uh, for getting a color. And then most of the towns in Western Massachusetts are so small that they're going to continue to change from green to red to yellow based on very, very small differences numerically in raw numbers. Um, so that's, I think, my concern about the state. I agree with Mr. Demling. Um, I try not to be critical when, when um, because there's no playbook for COVID. I don't know why we're seemingly the only state that has um, is looking at towns in such a small way, in my opinion. So uh, I think your larger point is well taken, Ms. Lord. It's not about at all what what you said, I think being aware if there are communities that are going up, but um, at the same time, those rates are still really small in the overall context. And unless staff members are showing symptoms, um, I don't see a reason to exclude them from coming to work. And the same with students who are school choice students, um, because the relative difference between Granby and Amherst right now, uh, or Pelham or Leverett it, it is not that great if you look at the raw numbers, but when you put a percentage in a small town like Granby or Belchertown, um, and then it gets a certain color designation. Um, that's where I struggle. I think for large communities, frankly, it does make sense. I want to be realistic about that. If you're talking about Boston, if you're talking about Springfield, um, that that's uh, more densely populated areas where community spread is more can be more traced and tracked a little bit more than uh, in western rural, more rural Western Massachusetts. I still think of Amherst as rural. I know it's not really, but I grew up in New York, so you know, forgive me. Um, um, Ms. Hall, I saw your hand. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, obviously I know a lot of people have stated this over the course of these meetings. I'm not an epidemiologist or a public health expert. I do I do like how compared to other metrics, ours is more conservative. Um, I share the frustration that there's little guidance from state and federal authorities. Um, but I think too, the part on one of the earlier slides from here to point out is that like, this is, you know, this is really important. We have to have these metrics, but it's just part of a much bigger conversation about risk generally, and that there are very serious risks for some students staying out of school. And I think that 
you know, it's good to have something so it's less about like how how we feel about going back to school, but like what the numbers show and that, you know, we do have information and data on what the risks of keeping kids out of school for too long is. Um, and so we're forced to sort of, you know, go to this place where we have to see what other people are doing and do our best. But I, um, I like the conservatism of this um, and just generally feel good about where this is. Yep, thank you. Ms. Seeger? I, I too feel generally pretty good about where this is. Um, and echo the sentiments that a lot of people have shared. Um, one thing that comes up for me in thinking about this, and I don't know what the plan would be for how this would play out, or I imagine Dr. Morris, you would make a decision based on the current environment and that's in your court. Um, what I was thinking too, that that's not reflected here, um, and I want you, would want you as superintendent to feel empowered to do is, is to use your best judgment too. Um, if you have, if you know something that's not reflected in these numbers, to, to make the best call based on that, because you hear something from Amherst College, you hear something that's more local than, you know, and, and not registered here. Because um, I know the positivity tests are from a state number and they come out every Wednesday. Um, that I, I would want your best judgment to be part of these metrics as well, which I imagine they would be, but I'm just going to explicitly say that. Yeah, and we're in close to part, close contact with not just the Amherst Health Department, but the Quabbin, which includes Pelham, as well as uh, Leverett and Shutesbury. And, you know, when there are potential cases, um, there, there's some close communication with all four. I mean, I, I, in my uh, perfect world, we wouldn't have four health departments to, <laughs> to be in touch with in a regional district, but I think it gets to Mr. Demling's point earlier. But, you know, they're all wonderful to work with, and that's what we'll do. I see Mr. Menino, and then I think if, unless uh, folks have really urgent comments um, on this, we'll move on after Mr. Menino's question. I'm all in favor of Mike Morris using judgment, but I'm also in favor of a hard and fast cutoff rule. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want you to say, well, blah, 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 we're going to ignore the cutoff. How do you plan to handle that? The cutoff's the cutoff. I think what I took from Ms. Seeger's comment, and Ms. Seeger can correct me if I'm wrong, is if, if I'm hearing that, oh my God, there's this, you know, situation that's going to come out in a day and because the health department gives me a call, I may have access to data or to information before it becomes public and that I wouldn't have to wait for um, sort of a public accounting of numbers uh, before making decisions. And if, if I was off Ms. Seeger, then I apologize and I'm not, I'm not looking for more power than, than uh, has been granted me by, the, by, uh, by you all, but I think that's what I heard from you. That, that is exactly what I meant. There's these limits, but if you know something that should push us over them before they're actually published. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ms. Seeger, for the clarification. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that because uh, I agree with you. There's metrics and then and then using your best judgment before we reach those metrics. Um, hopefully that's clear. Great. Um, so I think we'll move on on the agenda. And I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing that I think we have some other uh, guests on the call that are presenting as part of the agenda item, two agenda items from now. So I'm just looked at Dr. Morris, would you like to, and if the committee agrees, um, are folks amenable to swapping D and E on our agendas since we're a little behind? Seeing nodding heads. Okay. So we'll move on. We'll, we'll come back to item D. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think there was a hand up. Oh, sorry, Mr. Demling. Well, unless I missed something, do, do you have a couple slides left on this item? Or? We did, but I think I, they sort of came up with Mr. Menino's comment before about how, um, you know, the differences and what they're measuring, the percent positive is measuring testing capacity primarily, right. and the number of new cases is, is measuring community spread. Um, so I could go over those, but I think it's also in the name of time. I'm, I'm happy to do whatever the committee would like, but. So we'll move on. Um, we'll we'll come back to D um, after this next item, and we'll we'll, we'll move on to um, item E, which is our distance learning update. Yeah. And so, uh, sorry, more slides, um, but you won't have to hear from me because we've got uh, Mr. Yaffe, Mr. Sadiq, and Mr. Slovin. So uh, I'll, I'll do some intro slides, but you'll get to hear some different voices, which I'm sure will be welcomed. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I'm trying to work on different semantics um, and talking about virtual education, and I'll explain why in a, in a minute. So a little different than what was listed on the agenda. Um, so the first thing, you've already seen all of these slides or this data, but I do think it's worth going back to what happened in the spring and what were some strengths and particularly what are some challenges that we need to consider as we head towards the fall, um, given that most of our students will start in a, in a, in a uh, virtual learning environment. This was um, based on staff responses. Um, you can see the satisfaction, dissatisfaction rate. Uh, one again, thank Obed for putting these together. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to improve? This was from qualitative data, you know, talked about stream of communication being clear, clear expectations for students in terms of attendance, participation and graded assignments, uh, you know, change the structure of the class, more synchronous learning, breakout rooms, professional development uh, for them, and assessing how much access and support students have. So those are some of the ideas um, that staff had. Uh, based on the parent or family responses, um, better communication seemed like a, a pretty key one. Uh, more organized structure and clear expectations in that virtual environment and higher quality instruction. Uh, the student responses, remember these were middle school and high school responses. Uh, there was a large uh, component of students who talked about struggling with uh, staying motivated. You can see those numbers that um, just about or 44% always or usually struggle to stay motivated in distance learning and, and actually sometimes it's 38%. So uh, really across the board, our middle school and high school students expressed a disengagement from um, distance learning. And some of the things they talked about being important were having more in-person time with other students, particularly with other teacher, better systems, again, for organizing work. Uh, and then the accountability piece, knowing the assignments are required and graded seem really important. And the final set of data was from, um, also from the staff responses, uh, you know, the level of personal connection and, and the majority of staff suggested that they felt somewhat just too connected or much too disconnected from students during our spring semester. I say all this not to be critical of what happened. What we had was emergency distance learning. This was not predictable. We didn't have planning. We didn't have training. So none of this is meant to be critiques. But it is important to look back and say, you know, what are areas we need to improve for the fall for students, for staff? and for the community. And so some different expectations actually coming from the state um, that I find helpful as compared to our other conversation. You know, in spring, we really focused on resource delivery. Uh, there was not as an explicit and uh, focus on instruction. Uh, for most of the spring semester, there was no instruction on new content K to eight uh, that was permitted only at the high school and, and, and very limited. Uh, there was an expectation that students would only be doing half a day of schoolwork. Uh, and remember, if you remember our surveys, that that was true. Our students indicated that they were doing, on average, about three hours of work a day. Uh, the professional development for staff was very rushed, and the little bit we did for caregivers also rushed. And it was really focused on tools and applications. How do you use Google Calendar? Uh, what are the structures of uh, how to do that? How do you submit assignments? Um, it was very technical in nature, and it should have been, because we didn't have the technical skills. We're not a virtual school, and, and so it needed to be. Uh, but that was really the intentional focus, and people did a fabulous job. Our tech team did uh, outstanding work last year, creating trainings for staff on those technical pieces. Um, but really what I want to move to is talking about virtual education and not distance learning. So the focus is on instruction. Um, it's not on resource. It's not on creating resources for families exclusively to do with their children. Um, it's on teaching children uh, and teaching our students. And we heard that loud and clear, I want to say, when we were over, um, Anis had the road on Saturday, that the, really the expectation of that community was um, that we teach their children, not that we provide resources for them to teach the children, but that we as educators are in charge of the instruction and they're uh, responsible for their children, even in a virtual context. I fully endorse and agree with that. Uh, at all grade levels, new uh, instruction and new content and standards, uh, 170 days, and as compared to last year, the time on, learn, time on learning standards uh, or time on learning numbers are not released. So in other words, we are responsible for 850 hours at the elementary and 935 hours at secondary of time on learning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier last spring, all of that was relaxed and that's not the case. And I very clear directive from the commissioner, which he got from his board, that those will not be relaxed this year. Uh, we are approaching this with a, a thoughtful approach to professional development. We have 10 days prior to the school year and, and I, I rarely use bold uh, language uh, in my slides, but it's not just about the tech tools. It's about the pedagogy. How do we teach online? What is? How do you take an, an in-person course and transition that to online education? 
uh, you know, we'll talk about it in a minute, but one thing we learned last spring is having 20 students on calls, uh, particularly at the K-8 level, but I think beyond that, was not the most appropriate approach. In school, that works pretty well. We have a lot of good track record with having 20 students in a classroom. In a virtual environment, uh, like we're having here, if we were had five people on this meeting, we'd have an opportunity for a lot more dialogue and, and exchange, uh, even as adults. And if you think about six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, uh, you can imagine how much that extrapolates. So, you know, we're really thinking about how do we provide professional development? What are the roles? How do we delineate roles? And this really goes back to the guiding principles work that staff did in the spring, both at the elementary and secondary level of what this could look like, which is foundational for us. Uh, and the last thing there is a, is a, is a quote from the DESE guidance on, uh, I think they call it distance learning, uh, and I'll just read it out loud. Students have, must have regular, consistent opportunities to access live synchronous instruction, student-to-student -student interaction, collaborative assignments and projects, teacher feedback, and other needed supports as they are critical for student academic growth and meaningful student and family engagement. Uh, I, I fully endorse um, the state's commitment to that. It's what our students need. Uh, it's what we heard from families in the spring. It's what we continue to hear from families as needed uh, for distance learning or virtual education in the fall. So our training plan for August and September PD days, there's four primary objectives to that training that we want to support um, the acquisition of, of skills and competencies of our staff. Uh, one is on student agency. We want students like in the, you've heard this term before. Um, I think Mr. Yaffe used it last year when he was presenting his school improvement plan actually, that we want students to be actively owning their own learning and leading their own learning. I think that was Mr. Yaffe's quote. And, and that's true even more so in the virtual environment that if we don't, if we're not able to engage students and have them take a leadership role, given the nature of virtual education, we know that we won't be successful. So that's why that one's at number one. Second one's on relationship building. We know that it's critical that students feel connected to their educators. Um, and that is a challenge in a virtual environment. And we wanna support our educators to gain tips and strategies. Uh, Cause unlike last year, they won't necessarily have a relationship at the beginning of the year. Last year, they had six, seven months to build that relationship and to fall back on as we were moving to distance learning. Uh, they won't have that this time around. Third one, which again, all of these address some of the critiques that you saw from staff, families, and students is about wayfinding. Wayfinding, uh, the, the, the way you might think of wayfinding is, let's say you go into a grocery store and it's one you haven't been in before. How do you know where the grocery, where, how do you know where the bananas are? Let's say you're looking for fruits. You know, you look for signage, right? You wanna know that where everything is. So you can get what you need and, and, and be successful in your experience in a grocery store. And that's the way we think about online environments. We wanna support our students and families so they know where their assignments are. They know when their synchronous times are. They know one click and they're in. The number of, if we can reduce the number of clicks for students and families, we will be much better off. It's particularly focused on equity because what we know about different learners who may have different abilities um, about accessing content, they also may have different experiences and uh, with technology. Some of our students are using phones since they're you know, before they're speaking. Uh, and then other students are accessing Chromebooks and other things for the first time. So wayfinding is really helping supporting students and families so they can get to what they need and they can access the curriculum. And the last one's about assessment. You know, traditional tests don't make sense in an online environment, don't make particular sense. We could have a larger conversation where they make sense in an in-person environment another day, but they certainly don't make the same kind of sense in a virtual environment. So how do we know what students are learning? if? We're, they're doing what we're doing, talking online and doing learning online. And that's a really different thing. And, and so I feel like if we can do those four things well, uh, even just those four things, we will have a dramatically better experience for our students in the spring, uh, the, the spruiting that our students had in the spring. I'm not gonna go through it because of the hour, but if you wanna click on the summary of norms and online competencies, a, a place we're working with, developed, I thought a very helpful list of what are norms, what are goals for online and what are competencies we want our staff working on. Uh, and we're providing that training again in the, before the uh, school year starts. I've taken a training with them um, around this. Um, Mr. Sheehan, our curriculum coordinator, our element, and Mr. Sadiq, uh, our elementary principals uh, are taking a training this week as well. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we're positioning our leaders to be effective in this way um, too. At this point, I wanna turn it over to Mr. Yaffe, who's gonna briefly talk through the elementary draft schedule. I wanna note that these are student schedules that uh, anytime we're talking about a change in schedule, that's a, arguing, uh, that's a, a topic that uh, occurs in bargaining. Um, so these are draft, but they are based on the feedback we received last spring from those groups worked on guiding principles. Uh, at the middle school, high school level, there's also been staff um, 
the existing leadership structures, uh, structures have been involved in this. Um, but at the elementary level, um, actually, why don't I do uh, some of this, Nick, and then I'll, I'll turn to you for the one through six, if that's okay. Um, so, you know, you, again, I'm not going to go through the priorities and structure. Uh, I'm not going to read down it. But what we want to be is we want to have consistency so students and families know what's happening when, and it's consistent every single day of the week. We want to, we, we know that small group instruction is where it's at for our youngest students, and we want to provide that for our students. Uh, we want to balance um, screen time. That's a concern of many, many families, and we want to get the right balance between having synchronous and asynchronous lessons and content uh, and, and off-screen activities. Uh, and again, we want to foster those communities uh, through social emotional time. Um, so I'm going to just talk kindergarten, and then uh, Mr. Yaffe is going to talk one through six. So when we thought about kindergartners, kindergartners are uh, generally five years old when they're coming in. They have not typically, unless they're in our preschool program, been in our schools before. Uh, many of them have not been on uh, calls like this before. So we really wanted to balance what we thought we could do for students in an online environment. And really what it boiled down to is we wanted to have um, lessons on social emotional learning, critical point of kindergarten. We wanted to have a mini lesson on literacy, and we wanted to have a mini lesson on math. And even though there's lots more we'd love to do with our youngest learners, we feel like from a screen time perspective, from a age developmental perspective, the fact that we're in a distance or learning environment, uh, we didn't feel like we wanted to tax our youngest students or we'd be successful uh, working with students and getting them on screens more often. And so what we developed is a sample day uh, where a kindergarten class, essentially a typical kindergarten class, let's say it's 18 students, would be divided in half. Um, and there'd be a morning shift and an afternoon shift um, so that all day, there's, you know, when they're in their uh, synchronous lessons, there's a small group all the time for our, our youngest learners. Um, we didn't see a lot of value of having 18 students uh, in kindergarten uh, on a large call. We also didn't see value of spreading out lessons for beyond the time that we have now from a screen time perspective, as well as just developmentally. Um, so this is a shift. We're not thinking of half day for in-person kindergarten. Uh, but when we started thinking about what a full day of virtual learning would look like uh, for five-year-olds, uh, we sort of came down that we wanted to go quality over quantity. Um, and we wanted, so that's sort of where we landed. It was a way to keep our group sizes small and, and keep focused on the most important parts of, of uh, kindergarten that we felt like we could achieve in a virtual environment. I miss anything, Nick, or am I doing okay? Okay, so I will. Uh, turn great, Mike. Okay, um, before we go to one through six, um, I think there was a question earlier about Cominantes, and uh, perhaps I'll just pause to see if there's any questions before I turn it over to Principal Yaffe to go through a one through six schedule. Mr. Menino? Just a silly question. I assume morning meeting is circle. How do you do circle uh, in a distance learning environment? I thought I saw some great examples of young yeah. teacher of, of not young teachers, but teachers working with young children. It looks different. You're right. Um, but, you know, one of the most successful things that I saw in kindergarten classrooms was sharing. And, um, you know, our chairs do this from time to time where they'll go around and they'll ask everyone for their opinion on a topic. Uh, what that looks like in kindergarten is there may be a couple days, uh, a couple kids on Mondays. Uh, and they present something to share, which would be something that would happen in a typical kindergarten classroom. But everyone else is able to comment on that. Um, so the structure, actually, it's not perfect. It's not as good as in person. I will never say that, Mr. Menino. I think actually it was successful at, at promoting student agency. Uh, and I think some of our kindergarten teachers really were able to create that environment uh, for, for rather short periods of time. It's not sustainable if you have all nine kids talking by the time you get to the ninth kid. What's the first kid doing, right? We want to be realistic about attention span and screens for young kids. But, you know, that's an example of something I saw that was really successful that teachers, uh, kindergarten teachers did last spring. Okay. Ms. Spitzer? Sorry. Um, so I'm looking at this and, and recognizing that the kindergartners, I think, will be in the first phase. So I guess this will be the choice for folks who, who who choose to stay home or in the event that we need to close schools because of the public health metrics or so, something, some emergency type of situation arises. But I think one of my questions is, the, the number of transitions potentially seems like a lot here. Um, 
and I'm curious about like, is it you're gonna have the parent log the kid on once and the kid's gonna hopefully be able to get from 850 to around 11 without, with minimal parent involvement? Or is there an idea that there will be, and I, and I shouldn't say parent, I should say like some, some adult who, who, who can navigate this technology, helping them with these um, frequent transitions between, between the different sections? Yeah, so uh, we talked about that this afternoon, actually, in our leadership team meeting. Um, and, um, you know, I think two things. One is uh, you sort of have two choices. Either you keep kids online for long periods of time, which has proven unsuccessful for our youngest learners, or you have them on time in, in, in rather small segments with breaks in between. So I think you're right that some of the training that we're planning is for caregivers. That's the term I'm going to use for because I think there's a whole range of people who will be in the caregiver mode uh, this year. It will involve caregiver involvement. I don't think we're going to be expecting uh, students who haven't been in our school to be able to navigate things. We are also looking at Seesaw, which is a different online platform than Google Classroom. It's more designed for young learners, and it, it allows for a little more, it's easier to navigate. I'm just going to, it is easier to navigate. I think that's, you know, it sounds like an opinion or a fact, but I think it's, it's pretty close to one, uh, to facilitate both for caregivers and for our youngest students. And some of the training that we want to do is how do we train students to be more independent in doing that? But, um, you know, you're right about the transitions. And yet, if you go into a kindergarten classroom now, you'll notice things are not on a formal schedule. Um, but kindergartens are transitioning throughout the day because it, it is a very fluid environment for our five-year-olds. And we don't have a bell schedule. So, you, you know, yes, each year, Mr. Yaffe and his colleagues create kindergarten schedules. And, you know, it's not true that at 10 o'clock, all of a sudden everything stops in mathematics because that's not the way, you know, we view, in my opinion, we view uh, kindergartners and our youngest students, that there is a lot more fluidity to it. Um, but, you know, the idea of having uh, young students online for, for hours at a stretch, um, I think it's just developmentally uh, not where we're going to be at. So I'll address, there was a question before about Cominantes, so I want to be really clear about that one, and then I'll turn to Mr. Yaffe to go to one through six. We, we are really envisioning Cominantes to be an in-person program for kindergartners. It's a little different when students have been through a year of it, um, but Cominantes requires a high level of oral language and oral development, involves speaking and, and listening uh, because of the, the two languages being spoken. Uh, if it is the case that students want to not attend uh, in-person school, you know, we're trying to figure out are there pathways to join in first grade given this unique environment. Uh, but, you know, when we think about the expectations we have and uh, how intense, frankly, Cominantes is on students because there is so much oral language uh, because of the two languages, uh, you know, we don't see that as being a good fit for an online environment. Um, and, you know, it would require more screen time than we're comfortable with or it would require a caregiver to be bilingual. Um, and neither of those do we feel like we can count on reliably. So uh, in the conversations I referenced earlier with Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain, we are saying this is going to be a different year, um, that families um, who choose a virtual option, um, that's not going to be something. We also can't assume that the Comandantes teachers can teach both the students who are in school plus the students who are online, um, because there's, there's not that many of them. It's not like fourth grade where you could figure out the staffing. Uh, that, that's not our situation. Uh, but we are thinking about an on-ramp, uh, particularly uh, for Spanish-speaking or sp families with Spanish language backgrounds, uh, but for other students as well to see what we can do for first grade, assuming the situation is improved a year from now. So I wanted to be explicit about that because I think it was a good question that I think Mr. Demling brought up, but maybe not. Uh, someone brought up during a superintendent update, but um, you know what we don't want to do is push students into a program that we don't feel we have sufficient, we are able to provide sufficient time for oral language development, uh, particularly for our youngest children. Uh, pushing kids to be online for longer stretches of the day, we, I think we have evidence is unsuccessful, uh, both locally, but also from a, a research base. But also we don't, if we can't provide that oral language development, I think it really begs a question for students who haven't been in a dual language program before how successful it'll be. So we are trying to think about what we can do for a first grade on-ramp uh, in that situation, but it is the case that we don't feel like a half day program or even a full day if we tried to stretch it would be developmentally appropriate for our kids. And with that, I'll turn to Mr. Yaffe uh, and I'll turn the slide. Thanks, Mike. Um, just want to check, can everybody hear me? Okay, yeah. how are you all? Good, how are you all holding up? <laughs> So if, if you were a classroom, I definitely think you would need a movement break right now in the schedule. So 
I just want to point out that we did include that in the schedule, uh, movement <laughs> breaks. And so, you know, I, I, I can't remember how many weeks it's been since I spoke to you last um, and talked about joy and referenced uh, the cultural figure of Marie Kondo. Remember that? Some of you were there. <laughs> and so that's, that's true of this schedule as well, that for all of us to think of this as a framework that will allow our staff who are very creative uh, to infuse it with joy and Mike used the word agent, uh, agency, that students will really lead their own learning within this. And, and based on the feedback, if you look at that, really the places are that, uh, that uh, really stand out are these opportunities to connect with students so that teachers feel agency too, that they're actually feeling like they're connecting with individual students, that they know every student and that they are giving feedback about learning. And the idea is that that's going to help our teachers feel energized because teachers all over the country also were feeling like, is this making a difference, this online learning? So we want to build that mutual relationship. And, and I think last time we talked about the first six weeks of school. And so a schedule like this is really meant to build relationships and also allow uh, different places for teachers to teach students how to do the online learning. So again, the asynchronous is a way to deliver the instruction, but the real juicy time comes in the small groups when a teacher, so if you imagine if I were talking to four of you, um, how different that would feel and how I would pause and I would say, okay, you know, let's turn and talk to each other. Um, you share with, each person would get a chance to share what they think about this particular math problem. So that's what we were trying to do. And certainly our teaching teams will make this come alive and, and do the things that we talked about last time in terms of integrating the arts, uh, going deeper into the learning, project-based learning as well. Um, we did put in certain blocks. We did like the uh, WIN acronym. Uh, we like to call that a win-win. And so this is really a, a particular block of time where service providers can, that's what the MTS, multi-tiered service system, another acronym. But what that means is that people are coming in to these small groups and delivering the services. So that would be perhaps our speech or our OTs or PTs, our reading or math uh, interventionists, our ELL teachers. Um, and you might notice that there's a bookend. So really for families, because of what uh, Dr. Morris was saying, the families really need a structure as well. So there's the bookend of let's gather together in the morning meeting. And then at the end of the day, we're coming back together because we really want our teachers who are experts at doing this in the in person, but to build a classroom community. Um, just as a relation, related aside, as, as Dr. Morris was saying, we're all learning right now in some of this uh, as principals, and there are, people are doing some great thinking out there. One simple idea they had was like, okay, you can have online, at the elementary level, online jobs. What are some online jobs that people can do just to build that classroom community, to have a sense of responsibility? And, and so I, I, I feel, I felt, and I feel the sense of excitement like I'm learning. And that's what we want to create with our teachers and, and certainly with the kids. Um, the other part that we threw in there was the asynchronous exploration. And one of the things that we want students to have is the sense of, of that they can explore and, and explore things that they're interested in. And that's what I think our at-home learning gives us an opportunity to dive deeper into that. I've done a bunch of talking and, and one of the questions one of the questions that we ask is like, okay, in an online environment, how can you tell everybody's engaged? You know, so like if I look out at all of you, like how can I tell if you're engaged? And and one way perhaps could be if you ask a question. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I don't like to should I say anything else at this point? Uh, can I add two things uh, yeah, just very briefly? Sure. 
one is I'd be remiss this morning. I was in a meeting with Mr. Sheehan with some of the arts and uh, instrumental music yeah. folks, and they're really interested. So I think some of this, we're really clear on two things. One, this is a draft. And the second that um, this is a student schedule. It's not a staff right. schedule. And, and I know we said that, but I want to really emphasize that point that we were thinking, and, and if you look, go back to the guiding principles more broadly about staff and roles, and you know, it may look a little different. It should look different from all the training I've received and research than what roles look like in an in-person environment about you know, who's teaching asynchronously and is there a shared mini lesson that then allows for smaller groups to be meeting throughout the day. So I just wanted to emphasize both the point around the arts as being something right. that we're continuing. And I got, I happen to be in a meeting that was very generative this morning around that. And there's a lot of teacher energy uh, that we want to harness. And this is a draft. And then also this is a student schedule, not a staff schedule. So I just wanted to just add those points and then let the questions fly. Yeah. Nick, this is really very engaging. <laughs> yeah, if I could jump in like with the specials, we put that in the schedule, but really our specials teachers came up with so many fabulous ideas to integrate the arts into an online schedule. and. And we want them to then now, okay, here's your placeholder, but then how, how can we do that so that students are, are exploring the arts and then coming back and sharing? So there really is this sense that they're, they're participating um, in, in learning. I think that idea of like you're catching and then releasing and then children are coming back because they want to, they want to share what they've learned. That, that's the whole beauty of all this. Um, if it starts to click. Okay, I'm done. Uh, um, Ms. Lord, and then Mr. Menino. Yes, thank you for this presentation, Mr. Yaffe. I have a question about, it seems that the at-home learning has more time allotted than the in-school because they're coming in later than that. But I just didn't know if that was true. Or if you could address so i can right. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, i'm happy to to take that so it actually has uh, fewer hours of direct instruction than they would have during the school day um uh but the instruction is in smaller groups and you know i think that's where we get to the balance uh you'll see this actually throughout our uh, our approach as a district is you know we don't want kids on screen for six hours right there are some districts in the country that are doing that we don't feel like an effective use of time and we want to teach the curriculum because kids need to learn. And so the best way we could think about how to approach that is we reduce the amount of time that people have to be on screens, uh, allow for independent work, but have small groups um, that teachers can work with. So if you look, for instance, at the schedule from, um, let's say, literacy. Um, so if you look, literacy here goes starts at 1030 with an asynchronous lesson, uh, half an hour small group literacy, and then you get to independent literacy and MTSS, and that's a fancy term for you know what our Title I and intervention folks do. Yeah. So for, for most students, they're receiving an hour of literacy work, um, or excuse me, um, they're receiving 40 minutes of asynchronous and synchronous lesson in literacy. That's significantly less than they would get, they would get in the school environment. Uh, but what they are getting is students who need additional support will have that. Uh, and they're also getting a longer period of time to do work off screen uh you know or at least more independently and i think for us that's the right balance and we've been on this meeting for for two hours and five minutes i think we all no matter how engaging mr yaffe is and he is engaging uh right that's a really different experience because we haven't had a break to go and work if we'd stopped somewhere along the way and i said you know uh, mr mino why don't you write down your thoughts about um the uh the metrics that would have been um he would have been able to be independently working he would have gotten a break from this environment and so it is fewer hours of quote unquote direct instruction, uh, but because there are the work sessions from a time on learning perspective, we feel it's appropriate. You know, something that I, I'm not in support of, and I, frankly, we heard it very clearly at, um, at, uh, when we were over on Saturday, is, is having a day or half day that we entrust to families to do work independently. You know, really what the model is, is an asynchronous lesson that's shared and maybe shared same lesson within fourth graders at a school or fourth graders across the districts in alignment, and then small group support to be successful uh, in that work, and then time to practice the work that's done more independently. And that's sort of the trend that we want to have. We want to start with an asynchronous lesson, uh, and that's really important because in a full schedule, you might stagger some groups so that group sizes can be really small. So the teacher schedules might look a little different um, than they typically do. Um, 
We want to have ongoing support in small groups that students can have uh, actively make connections with their, their peers and their teacher and get support they need. And we want them to be successfully working on independent tasks. Uh, in the school day, that sort of mirrors some parts, but there's no real, I mean, there is independent work, but the teacher's always there. Uh, but we want students to be able to shut off their screen and do that work independently so they get a, a break from being in this environment. Because, you know, I just don't think, even at the high school level, being online for six hours is, is benefiting anybody. I think we all can agree on that. We've met for lots of hours. And at some point, uh, you know, uh, there's a, what's it called, a law of declining returns on productivity and efficiency. And I think, uh, especially for our youngest learners, we want to have a real balance there. Uh, Mr. Yaffe, you almost make distance learning sound exciting. Uh, <laughs> however, piggybacking on a um, public comment uh, that one, one, one um, person said, who will be teaching the third grade in Pelham? I mean, obviously the third grade teacher is teaching in class. We only have one third grade teacher. Who will the third grade teacher be to the people in Pelham who choose distance learning? Yeah, so I think that's a better question for me to take on than Mr. Yaffe's yeah. yeah, public schools. Um, I will, I'll, I'll take that one. So, you know, I think for this to work effectively, we really need to have a partnership between Union 26, which is the Amherst and Pelham schools. Um, I don't see it being effective, and this is not the only small school that's having this problem without going to kind of universal multi-age classes, right, uh, which some places are talking about doing. Or um, the other one, which we've talked about, I think you've asked about, Mr. Medino, actually, uh, places that are doing live streaming of the in-school lessons to people who are at home, which pedagogically is, uh, to me, uh, horrendously flawed. Sorry, I know places are doing that. I try not to be uh, critical, but um, I have a hard time running a meeting of the leadership team, which is a wonderfully collaborative group when some people are in person and some people aren't, let alone actually teaching uh, young children. Um, so for us, it will involve some collaboration as we get the student surveys back, uh, as well as understand staff concerns and, and you know, uh, exemptions for staff, which we'll talk about in an executive session tonight. I think that's where Union 26 collaboration really needs to happen uh, for all the reasons you suggested. Uh, Principal Yaffe, just give us a, a quick sample teaser taste of some of these amazing ideas you've heard for, for special um, <laughs> and remote learning. Because I, I, I totally get what you're saying about these, like the creativity of teachers is boundless in this space and you let them loose and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So just give, give us some, some examples of these, these ideas that you've heard. Well, they created that. What I was referring to is some of the things that they created last year, you know, really as, as online resources. and. And, you know, you can go to any of the websites to see, but there are things that I think can uniquely also be done at home. You know, whether it's the PE teacher creating games that you do with socks, you know, in, in so I think the other thing is, is to make sure that it's accessible to everybody. Or the art teacher uh, taking on what was called a, a Getty challenge from the Getty Art Museum where students recreate an art masterpiece. So you, you give them a library of these art masterpieces and then they use their creativity to create these sculptures at home. Or, or a music teacher who's asking the students to go on a, a musical scavenger hunt in, in their home, you know, and, and figuring out what types of musical sounds. So those are just a few that come to mind. Um, but they're things that uniquely, because they're so creative, they're, they have to do with the standards of course, the standards and um, and their particular art, but they're things that can be done at home that are accessible to everybody. I think that the part that we want to get to is that sort of feedback loop. Like, again, taking the example of this meeting, uh, please don't take any offense at this, but, you know, if each of you had something where you were coming back and you had to present to this meeting, your level of engagement and participation, you know, not that I want you to do that because you're not getting paid, and, but, uh, you know, would be different. So I think that's, that's an example of, of, of what we want to get to uh, more so that we're reaching all kids and they're feeling the sense of like ownership and, and what, as, as Dr. Morris said, agency. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Ms. Spitzer. Hey, Carrie. Hi. So I want to echo that I was very impressed with the specials teachers during um, the first uh, distance learning experience we had in the spring. So it was challenging in many ways, but I always looked forward to having that, that weekly challenge. And so I, I have a lot of confidence that we're going to continue to see that high level of creativity. Um, I guess I'm looking at this with the eyes of a caregiver and concerned about the fact that we're going to be phasing in. And, you know, I'm a mom of three. I'm sure there are other folks who are going to have one kid in phase one, one kid in phase two. And I'm supposed to be driving my kid in phase one to school at, to arrive at 950. Well, I'm also supposed to be getting my kindergartner or my third grader in a whole class social emotional learning morning meeting. And maybe I've got um, a baby who also needs to get into her daycare. Um, so I'm not saying this is like this is this is just a problem with the situation we're in. And I, I don't think there's a way to solve this. But I think I'm, I'm a little worried. You know, a lot of the challenge of the spring for me was trying to meet the needs of three different kids um, with very different needs at the same time. And honestly, what often happened is, you know, I would just drop out. And I am a highly, you know, um, resourced person. And I'm concerned about the folks in our community who don't have as many resources and who may not have a quiet place in their home or, um, you know, where their child can kind of isolate and like focus on this, or they may not yet be at the developmental phase where they can navigate the transitions on their own. And I, and I think that's the reason we're prioritizing the younger kids. But I guess where I'm, I'm a little concerned about thinking this through is like, how are we going to, if, if we're holding kids more accountable, which I think is something we should be doing and saying, you've got to do this assignment, you've got to show up, we're going to be taking your attendance. Like, how are we going to, though, also be giving that give and take for you have a tough situation at home. You may not yet be in that phase that's getting the in-person time. So, so I guess just thinking about what, what you guys are thinking about this really naughty problem that I, I'm, I'm worried about for the fall. Yeah, I can start. Uh, yeah, oh, no. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, this comes up in multiple places. So if you think about lunch, one of the reasons we have a long period for lunch and a recess is because we know that that's going to be a time where food deliveries happen. And one of the things we know is that was a problem in the spring. So uh, we, you know, not perfect, but we, we, and not that it takes all day, but our, it's not door to door food delivery. It's in certain locations. And uh, I think you're right. And that's one of the reasons that we're trying to think about synchronous lessons, asynchronous mini lessons that are followed up with synchronous direct. And, and what you can't see on the schedule is he says group A. Um, there's also a group B. And group B meets at slightly different times over the day. So that we're, it's not going to be perfect. We can't solve the naughty problem, uh, naughty, not naughty problem that you suggested. <laughs> um, but I, I think there is the, kind of the idea of having flexibility between slightly different times. But the asynchronous piece as, as the anchor um, allows for different times for the synchronous to happen. And if there are mornings where, with young children, there are mornings where your best laid plans don't work. Uh, having that asynchronous lesson being available, um, okay. even if some of the synchronous isn't possible for, for a number of different reasons, we feel like we'll, we'll allow families to at least have that anchor mini lesson that they can watch with their child if the timing doesn't work out on the other end. So, you know, we are actively thinking about the equity piece that you mentioned uh, and doing our best to try to accommodate that, knowing that every family has a unique circumstance. Uh, and, um, you know, that, I think trying to approach it as flexible as we can without being too flexible where nothing happens. And that's the balance we're trying to strike. And I think to add on to that with the empathy that um, would be just really um, having that communication with, with every family and checking in just to see you're in a unique situation. Similarly, for a teacher to be checking in with the student, whether he's in third grade or kindergarten, and just seeing that this parent partnership and communication is going to be even more important during this time. Okay. Do I call on people? Uh, Allison, are you doing that? Um, <laughs> oh, Brenda, Brenda. Hi, thank you. I just want to first, thanks for putting all this time and energy into this. I'm one of the parents who really wanted more synchronous instruction. Um, now, when, looking at this, having two kids and two um, uh, working parents, it looks a little overwhelming. 
And I wonder if you couldn't talk a little bit about which ones are expressly synchronous and which ones can you move around? I'm just thinking about bandwidth, using up so much energy or whatever we're using, Google um, Hangouts or whatever, um, and, and where the flexibility is and, and how many hours, I guess, of screen time there will be for these students. I can start, Nick, if you like. Sure, so yeah, you. when you're talking about asynchronous, right, so that's a video that's recorded. Um, those are generally 10 minutes or less because those are mini lessons, which even in person, we try to keep mini lessons less than that at the elementary level. Um, so we see um, where it says small group literacy, uh, small group and independent math. Um, the small group part is the synchronous uh, calls, uh, the whole class piece. It generally adds up to, you know, in the neighborhood of two and a half to three hours. Um, and that is looking nationally. That seems pretty similar. There's a lot of places the elementary league go into four hours. We felt like that was a little too much. Um, and I think for us, the way it's chunked felt developmentally appropriate, that it wasn't long, long stretches of being online, because for all of us, that's a challenge, let alone for young kids. Um, where you see independent literacy, that, that's not necessarily that screen time, that's the follow-up assignment that students would be working on. Um, and also the ind small group and in independent math, that's 40 minutes, but not all 40 minutes would be online. It'd probably be about 20 minutes online and 20 minutes independent. Um, and some of these, again, like MTSS, that's gonna be for individualized students. We need to provide small group or even individual reading tutorials. That's not necessarily for every child, but you know, the only way to do it is to to add time. In other words, we don't want them to not have access mm. to all the specials or the other electives. We do want to add time. So it ends up being about two and a half to three hours uh, at the elementary level. And it's going to be gradated, right? So if we think about first grade, that's probably going to start a little lower and at fifth and sixth grade be a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I think you're right. The overwhelming uh, number of parents uh, requested A, a schedule, and they knew when things were going to happen. Uh, B, uh, more synchronous connection, and that, that was true of all groups. Students said that, staff said that, family said that, uh, and we tried to get the right balance. I mean, a number of elementary school schedules I've seen have kind of one hour each for math, literacy, unit study, and 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 that that felt one hour straight, felt a little long, um, and then with, with, with breaks, and, and this one, for me anyway, I don't want to speak for Mr. Yaffe and the principals, uh, although I think I can on this one, we wanted to be, you know, have segments online and segments offline that that flow felt developmentally appropriate. Um, so I'm sorry, you know, that's good feedback. And maybe in our next iteration, we can uh, make that a little more explicit about what's online and what's not uh, as part of the schedule. So I appreciate that, Ms. Barlow. One clarifying question. Will a student, if they miss the asynchronous mini math lesson, will they be ready for the synchronous small group in math or? Right, so they, we, would, we would want them doing that. And I think, again, that's where the schedule is showing group A. There's another group that, that's juxtaposed with that, um, where you know we do want teach, students staying with their teachers. But the idea is that the mini lesson is the core foundational instructional piece. And that small group is kind of the next step of a lesson. And so um, we would want to have time. We talked this, this morning or this afternoon uh, and, and Jerry Champagne from IS was on, are there ways to set up reminders in Google Calendar and Seesaw? Because mm -hmm. um, that was a request that we received from families last year is, you know, can I sync my phone or my computer or my kid's computer so that five minutes before the math lesson starts, I get a little ping uh, because we're all so busy in the world. And so Jerry's working on what we could do to support students and families uh, around that, that point. Any other questions? Yeah, we do have a couple other schedules to get through as well. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Nick. I appreciate yeah, it. Care. All right. Bye bye. All right. So, the middle school, I'm going to actually go through rather quickly. Uh, Mr. Sharon had uh, another commitment tonight that wasn't changeable. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be very brief about it. Um, you know, what you see on the right side of the screen uh, really mimics much of what the elementary um, version was. Roughly 45 minute segments for the core classes, again, uh, with a mix of um, synchronous and asynchronous lessons, as well as off screen time, uh, being consistent and daily check ins during that morning advisory block. One of the things the middle school students who are watching will notice right away is that 
uh, they're getting up a lot later in the morning. That, uh, that morning block is really for independent study. As I mentioned before, the concept of homework is very blended in a um, secondary environment. I wonder if Ms. Gribko could think back to her middle school years and the shock of waking up that much earlier. Uh, for some students, perhaps is welcome. For most, is not from the information I get from my middle school friends. Um, and so really trying to plan some of that independent work, what used to be called homework and extensions activity for earlier in the morning, um, so that we're hitting our time around learning uh, benchmarks, but that people aren't opening up with bleary eyes to a screen uh, earlier than developmentally middle school students uh, are ready for it. Um, you can also see that we are working with our after school program and trying to figure out uh, clubs that can meet online um, and that we really do want, and you saw this in the other one, even though it's a student schedule, you might be wondering, we want to expand prep time and teacher collaboration time in the schedule because we think that will have better outcomes for students uh, in this regard. So a lot of similarities to the elementary uh, overall in terms of structure. Um, but you could see that there's, you know, different stretches of time, uh, you know, again, sh shorter blocks in some ways, uh, but we feel like middle school students can handle more classes a day uh, than their elementary counterparts. Um, so I can answer any brief questions on the middle school. It's certainly something that Mr. Sharon will be talking about next week at the town halls in a little more detail. Ms. Seeger. It would be handy to know in here which is synchronous, which is asynchronous, and which is independent work. And some of that is laid out in here, but I'm curious in looking at it, you know, more explicitly, what, what is which. So all of these, as opposed to the elementary level, it's a great point. I should have been more explicit about it. All these are courses. So the 930, you know, it's not every English or language arts class meets at 930, but on the student schedule, and the expectation with students being present at 930, uh, the expectation would not be that students would be on a Google Meet for 45 minutes for all of English class. So I think the way, you know, we are responsible for taking attendance every day in, in each course and that uh, much like we are right now. Um, so there, there has to be some way to, to monitor that. Um, but it's not the case that the Google Meet would last all 45 minutes um, long. But, but the idea is that students are in classes at the designated times at the middle school and high school level. You know, at the elementary level, it's true, but, it, you know, since it's not staying with different teachers and the same, the, the courses are uh, a little more uh, gray at the elementary level. But at middle school, high school, with our courses, there are attendance that need to be taken uh, and reported. Um, and really, I think, you know, what Mr. Sharon would like me to say, rightfully so, is that these daily check ins during morning advisory and other things are really critical to build the middle school community, uh, particularly in a virtual environment. So it is not the case that all day students are online, but it is the case that students are responsible for showing up a class on time. Um, and it'd be a mix of synchronous and asynchronous time. Ms. Uh, another question from Ms. Seeger. Yep. I think I just forgot it too. <laughs> oh, it was about, um, I know at the elementary level, there'll be small groups. Will there be opportunities at the middle school level to have small group interaction as well? There are, and, and one of the things that if you look at, if one looked back at our guiding principles, it was really trying to think about what's the concept of, um, you know, and I don't love the term because I think it means too many different things to different people, but office hours. So it might be that there's a live lesson that's relatively short and the teacher's available for the first, the next 20 minutes for one group and then the next 20 minutes after that for the other group. Uh, but, you know, again, at, at all grade levels, what we know uh, and what evidence would tell us is that large group instruction for long periods of time uh, online uh, is not the most engaged. You know, we talk about student agency. It doesn't contribute to student agency. Um, so again, uh, Mr. Sharon can, Principal Sharon can talk about that a little more detail. And I apologize that he couldn't be here tonight. Um, but uh, he'll be he'll be continuing. We can come back here. But on the town hall, I'll certainly speak to that as well. I had just um, one question. Would they? Um, I see the two blocks for exploratory. Would that include world languages, or will that be on hold for distance at the middle school next year? Uh, no, that would include one of those blocks for most students would be world language. Just that not every student takes world language, so we wanted to keep the language, the nomenclature more broad than that. But uh, for the majority of students at the middle school, one of those exploratories would, would include uh, a world language time. Um, I have a question. Um, I think this might have come up at the last meeting as a question. The possibility of having some kind of, at the beginning, um, some way for students to, to connect and meet their teachers 
perhaps in some kind of outdoor setting? Um, has that been talked about? It certainly has. That's something that, uh, you know, I think when we get into our executive session about bargaining, that's something that would have to come up and be bargained for. Um, so, um, but yeah, we've loosely had those conversations. Teachers have certainly brought that up with me, but, um, you know, that's something that we would want to work out the details from a health and safety perspective along with our, in a collaborative fashion with our association. Mr. Demling. Yeah, real quick, um, I see activities and clubs there. Is there anything that you can say definitively at this time about what's going to be offered for middle school in terms of activities and clubs with the online experience? Um, if Mr. Sharon was here, he could do a much better job than me, which I apologize. But I know, you know, our existing um, VELA program is actively engaged and they're uh, planning for fall. So, that, uh, you know, that's that's one of our larger after school programs and they are partnering with us. They know that the middle school is uh, primarily starting uh, in a virtual environment and our planning programming as such. So uh, that actually um, connects to um, a little bit to my question. So this, the schedule, uh, is this for families who, students who choose 100% um, virtual learning or is it also for students that will be, are choosing the in-person hybrid program and this is how they'll start. And I asked the question because I recall that the in-person schedule had fewer courses per semester. It is a difference that way. So, so the answer to your question is yes. This we, we feel like at least at this point, this would be the draft moving forward, both for the first quarter for the vast majority of middle school students. Um, the hybrid schedule would look a little bit different, but if we would want to maintain this for families who at that point choose to remain in the virtual model uh, beyond the end of the first quarter. Any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, Ms. Seeger. That, that does bring to mind a question for the students who everybody's remote in the beginning. And then when students do start to go back with well, seventh, eighth grade, they'll be back one day a week. I can imagine there's going to be a shift in teachers potentially between. Um, who's the teachers that the remote students have access to and the teachers who are physically in the classroom. So that could be an interesting problem to solve, I imagine. It is an interesting problem to solve. Um, I don't specifically have a question, but hopefully it wouldn't change too much for the students who decide to keep staying at home. Yeah, and it's something where actively you're spot on, you know, and that's why doing it at the quarter mark, at least uh, it's the end of a marking period, which is a very helpful thing. It's also the case that uh, we probably uh, would ask both of the middle school and high school uh, for those tier two students um, to have a little more heads up than what we're asking for for the tier one. You know, so for tier one, it's roughly a month before school starts. I think we're gonna need to ask probably six weeks before so that Mr. Shadiq, Mr. Sharon and their teams can, can sort out the pieces that you mentioned because it is gonna be complex. Okay. And I will very gladly turn this over to Mr. Sadiq, uh, who's been very patient. So thank you for hanging out with us at 940. Mr. Slovin's even more patient because he'll be after Mr. Mr. Sadiq. Um, but uh, they put a lot, of, a lot of hard work and thinking and a lot of staff engagement at their schools on the schedule. So I will flip over to the draft schedule for Amherst Regional High School. Uh, good evening. Um, so I'm going to be kind of brief and go through this. I think it's a lot of it's spelled out hopefully clearly on the on the screen. Um, you see the the idea is for each of the, the blocks to have a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So similar to what um, Dr. Morris had said about access to teachers, um, office hours, things of that nature, the plan is to have the students be able to access the teacher at different times to have the, the synchronous groups <clears throat> go on and then to be able to schedule times with the teachers either individually or in small groups as well. Um, I don't really know if you have any other questions. Again, it's I don't necessarily want to just read all the slides, but it's pretty clear, I think. And again, it is just a draft and we're going to continue to try to refine it in hopes to make the experience our students have as meaningful as possible in school. Uh, Ms. Gripko. Um, I just have a question about like advisories because usually we're doing like 
like every other week, I think. So is there, is that built into the schedule at all? So it's one of the things we've been trying to figure out where to put it and how to have it in the schedule now that we have fewer spaces to put it in. And so one of the thoughts is, is to have it, especially when we're in remote learning, again, every other week, but it could be one of the, like a 2.30 to 3 o'clock time right after school, or we've thought about it being in other places as well, but potentially 8.30 to 9, but that seems a little early. 9 o'clock is a little early. So basically, it's something we're still trying to figure out what makes the most sense. If you have thoughts and suggestions, I'm happy to hear them. <laughs> Ms. Lord. Will there also be the possibility for after school clubs online, like at the middle school? Yeah, that's definitely what we've been thinking about. A lot of the club leaders have been asking, and some of the students have been asking as well. And we're just trying to figure out again, um, finalizing some other pieces of the puzzle. And then, but the idea is to try to have as many electives in clubs and extracurricular activities as we can possibly do in online. We know how meaningful those are to a lot of the students. So uh, priority to try to fit in. Yeah, and I think um, if I could add to Mr. Principal Sadiq's comment, um, yeah, we did get a unusual advisory about athletics today that I forwarded to the committee. I say unusual because there's a lot of what, what's not, you know, and Ms. Stewart and I spoke this afternoon, what's not entirely clear is who makes which decision on sports. There's MIA, there's the state, which came out with something, there's DESE. So I think they're still sorting through all of those pieces. When, there, when there's clarity, we're happy, and Ms. Stewart's happy to come and talk. It didn't feel like there's clarity yet. Um, but I know many students and families have expressed an interest in both clubs, extracurriculars, and, and athletics, particularly certain athletics that perhaps are slightly less contact-based and, and, and occur outside. Um, and so this latest guidance, I think only that we received this today, only confused things more than clarified things. And so when we have real clarity, we'll bring it back to the community uh, as well as to the committee uh, to talk through that. But, you know, I've gotten a number of con uh, communications today asking what it meant. And then, you know, Ms. Stewart and I have to talk tomorrow, but it, it doesn't seem like I am any more clear today than I was yesterday. I don't know if you feel the same, Mr. Sadiq, but that's, that's where I'm sitting. Yeah, there's still some things that there's not a lot of clarity on, but we're actively thinking on trying to get clarity and come up with as many different options and possibilities to engage students, not only academically, but also physically, because we know how important it is to their social emotional health. I had a question. It, it appears that this, um, the, this virtual schedule is following the same block schedule that the in-person hybrid would be following. Is that, is my understanding correct? Correct, yeah, that was part of the reason we chose this is because it can work for the virtual and the in-person schedule as well. Yeah. That's nice, helpful, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? I'm not seeing any. I can't see everybody on the screen, so if I'm not calling, if you're waving wildly um, and I'm not calling on you, please speak up. No? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sadiq. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate all the hard work you're doing. Take care. Talk to Thank you. you. Bye. And Good evening. Mr. Sloven. I feel like I'm always getting a bad cleanup, and I, I enjoy that. Um, <laughs> So uh, we had myself, a couple teachers and our clinicians work on this schedule. And um, one thing that, you know, it's, it's been kind of, you know, crazy making is that we are a phase one school and we're also creating this virtual, you know, uh, schedule. And so we're trying to make it so that it, it, it can somewhat like the high school be close to what if we had to do uh, some, because some students probably will not show up for us and they'll be virtual. And so we're, we haven't yet made it so that it's exactly the same like the high school. And so I just wanted to note that. So it's not one of those situations where, you know, it is a draft and it does look different than the schedule that I showed you last time. Um, 
but it but what what's important is that we feel like it uh will address um all our student needs um in the classroom and also in a student support situation and so um it's gonna be really important for us to be able to uh during again like uh, dr morris said a block is a class it's an algebra one class or or a, you know, a Shakespeare class and how that's broken down and how kids are individually supported is really critical to our success. The great piece that we've, uh, we've enjoyed is that we had a whole summer school and we've learned an uh, incredible amount from our students about what works. And one of the things that we know is much more helpful than what happened in the spring is synchronous kind of learning. And, and so, so those blocks are definitely places where synchronous learning is going to happen and there's going to be some asynchronous learning. Um, you know, the things to mark is at the beginning, the beginning of the day, we have a really uh, a, what I think is a nice time where students will be able to get support with uh, paraprofessionals um, and, and connected with uh, um, other students during that time. If if they want to, and hopefully they will. Um, and then we'll have this uh, morning mindfulness that'll be run by clinicians that we're hoping will be, which is a really important place that we're kind of easing into our day and connecting with each other. Because, you know, one of our, our major goals is, is agency, motivation and relationship. And, um, and we all kind of want to be in that, that groove together. And then you'll see throughout the day, you see little screen breaks. Um, and th those are important as well. And um, at the, the end of the day is another time where we'll have some, some check-ins or check-outs with, with support staff. It's going to be critical for us to engage all the students in the classrooms. But also, we are really looking forward to, to breakout uh, rooms, meaning and they've been doing it in summer where they actually pair up with adults and they have their own codes and they meet in other spaces. And we've found that that's uh, been successful. Last piece is that I'm really proud to say that uh, a few of our students in the summer uh, um, presented today about the pros and cons of distance learning. And we're gonna use that to kind of um, situation ourselves uh, feedback wise from the students but the really cool piece is dr brady already shared that with uh desi and russell johnson and he was really impressed and it and it just kind of showcases that when we're when we're uh locking in with the students and letting the students voices really come out we're, we're gonna you know have a better chance at success so any questions uh, the, the only last thing I would say is that if you look at uh, the block that where it says transition groups, that's a really uh, uh, important part of our community. And it, and it includes community meeting, it, can, it includes therapeutic groups, it can it includes advisory or directed support. And then we're also going to try to make sure that it includes some leisure connections. So questions. Mr. Sullivan, thank you for turning on your light. My computer's dying here. Um, I'm just curious, when are you going to survey the students, parents, guardians, and caregivers about who's going to return and who's not going to return? That's a great question. And so we're on it. We've, we've already, you know, we already have our list going. The, the great piece is that our clinicians have been working with families all summer. So the last week or so, they, they were told about this survey that's coming from central office, but we were already kind of, what, what that first conversation is, we, did, we, we want people to be able to sit with it and partner with them to, to make the best decision for their, their student and their family. And so, so we're, we're on it already. One of the, one of the what my clinicians have, has brought up, I, I'd really like to do a town hall kind of, meeting with all the parents because it, you know you can only do so many videos or only do so many um 
uh, emails. And so we're hoping that that will help as well, but we've already been in the discussions. So um, literally we have checklists of, oh, we've talked with this, this family and they, and we're not, you know, unfortunately we can't give them everything. I mean, this is the, 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 the trepidation that I feel every day or, you know, just kind of not, not being in that place of absolutely knowing uh, how, how things will end up. Um, and certainly getting the variables in place about who's going to be there and who's going to be uh, uh, at home virtually is going to have a significant effect on how we distribute and give our, you know, instruct. So, so it is something that I'm hoping we'll, we'll be able to solve and or at least get closer to the numbers in the next week or so. And that will guide us. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And I, I understand that with a smaller group of students that you, you do stay in touch with them a lot more and are able to do that than the high school itself. So good luck with that. I appreciate it. Yeah, the clinicians are really locked in with the families and it's, you know, it's happening all the time. So we're, we're lucky that way. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any from the folks that are on screen. No? Okay, great. I've got two more thank slides you. about the family piece, but thank you, Principal Slovin. Appreciate it. Hope you have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, so very briefly, because at the time, uh, I think it is worth talking about the family and caregiver support. Um, so uh, Dr. Guevara worked on these slides with me. Um, or she primarily wrote them and, you know, I just did a little uh, alignment, uh, make it fit with the rest of the presentation, but, you know, that we want to be in contact, and I think this was referenced actually by uh, a couple of the principals periodically about what's needed to help their children be successful. Um, and and how, how do people want to be contacted, their work schedules, which came up earlier. Uh, we want to support student attendance, uh, attendance critical. If students aren't there, they're not going to be learning with us. Um, and so this typo, which is my mistake, but para school maintaining attendance records, we use our same systems, but that, that way, especially the middle school, high school, there's access to student grades as well as attendance and as well as assignments. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone's getting the same information. They understand what school will look like in the fall. Uh, you know, one district phone number, which the family center will manage, uh, designated to answer all inquiries from families so that it's really one-stop shopping or, uh, around that. And in terms of technology, we talked about it before. I just want to, again, thank the PGO because they raised um, so much uh, so much funds that we're able to extend that into this year, which um, was um, prescient. Um, also, uh, we heard some feedback last week at the town hall for, about headphones. Uh, it came up tonight earlier about you know student uh, families with multiple students in uh, relatively small spaces and how critical it was for the students to have, a, have access. And this, again, goes to, you know, where I started Superintendent Update, Jerry Champagne has already ordered a thousand um, kind of those, you know, ear, earbud headphones with microphones that can be used, um, and they'll be coming before the school year starts. So we are primarily thinking of income eligible families to start with. We didn't buy them for every student because we know a lot of students already have them, um, but we, we tried to prorate out how many income eligible students we have across the districts. Um, not every student is planning to start virtually, but um, so and if there's a need to buy more, we'll have more, but we will have access of, you know, thank you to the feedback of folks who came to that forum last Saturday that's led to direct action that's gonna benefit our students and our families. Uh, and also the last thing I think I referenced it earlier is one thing we didn't do enough of last year and was caregiver workshops. Uh, and I think it's okay that we didn't, I don't think there's much carryover because the caregivers may be different people this spring, this fall than they were in the spring, but we want to be much more intentional before the school year starts about caregiver workshops uh, to make sure we're supporting families with how to support their children in this different environment. And I'll end there. Okay. Any uh, closing questions from anybody? Not seeing anything. Um, so I'm going to um, make a uh, suggestion, and I hate doing this because poor policy just keeps getting booted off of the agenda. Um, but given the hour um, and, and and that we still have an executive session on our agenda, I'm, I'm going to propose that we table the 
the item D that I promised we would come back to, um, but maybe if I did not say tonight <laughs> um, that we table that um, for our next meeting, which maybe um, is, is quite possible to be next week. Are, are folks, is the committees, are the committees okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, got it. So we'll move to uh, future addenda planning. Um, I, I sort of already preempted that. <laughs> Um, so we're uh, looking to have a meeting um, next Thursday um, that uh, I'm trying to remember. I can't, uh, Dr. Marsek, maybe you, yep, yeah, I'll let you speak to that. So I think what I had is what you just mentioned with the policies um, and um, uh, probably another executive session to hear um, the, similar to the one we're having tonight. Um, and there was a question about food service and transportation. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be ready on Thursday because that group is the one that's most anxiously awaiting the feedback of the survey on Tuesday. So we talked a little bit about it, um, but uh, we're going to see if that's possible. Um, but I think, you know, certainly an executive session seems like it'd be warranted. The policies seem like they're warranted. Uh, we may need to get back to the, um, Dr. Guevara went to um, the new uh, harassment training that the Title IX regs changed. I'm not sure we're ready for next Thursday. It depends on Mr. Terry and whether he can get us a draft policy uh, and how that goes with the policy subcommittee. But since that law goes into effect tomorrow, we probably shouldn't wait too long. So those are the, the agenda topics I have. Hopefully it'll be uh, perhaps a briefer meeting uh, where we don't add additional items too much. Ms. Stancer. Um, so, I wondered if we, I don't know about next week, but we do need to go back to the superintendent evaluation. And Carrie, I was going to offer to help with that if, if there's any way I could help. Ms. Spencer? Yeah, so um, I think the big thing has just been actually trying to give the superintendent some time to prepare for. Uh, the presentation. So we have the instrument ready to go. We voted on it. Um, the big thing has just been that all this guidance was coming out day by day and trying to keep up with it. I, I share your feeling that we need to, I, I'd like to be able to check that box and, and not have the school committee, um, you know, be called up for not, not having, you know, done one of its main main goals, but hopefully the community will be understanding that we've been dealing with this goal of the back to school readiness and trying to plan for that. So, um, we we could have a conversation offline maybe about timing of it later on um or i see mr demling's hand is up mr demling yeah i mean this is another one of those funny topics right where like it's definitely true that evaluating the superintendent is one of our most important responsibilities and we should do it in a timely fashion and I, i'm in a little bit of a different place than i was a couple of months ago i mean a couple of months ago we were obviously still planning about fall, you know, in, in a major way. Um, and and at, at the time I was thinking, you know, I want to get to the superintendent evaluation before I forget everything that happened um, before COVID. At this point, everything that was in my context memory pre-COVID has left my context memory. <laughs> and, and it's not that I can't go back and remember, but, you know, that's going to take some effort at this point. And and now that we're we're at this we're this really rapid, intense implementation phase for the superintendent in the district, I, I I'm I'm kind of reticent to to want to take any any of that time away from the superintendent of the district. So I could get I guess I could go either way if, if if the committees felt strongly that you know what let's just put this to bed and 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 do it. I, I could go that way if if the superintendent was like yeah I'd really rather have the eight or ten or sixteen or whatever number of hours it's going to take to to prep for this then then I could be swayed that way I guess I, I just wanted to put it out there that I, I am as much as I don't want to drag it out too long I, I am feeling a little a little less urgency now now that we are you know five weeks to the star school so uh, so I guess I have a question. Um, because really so much, it seems to me, I agree so much, even though we went all the way to March, so much of this year really now, the end has been about the emergency stuff that we've had to do. Um, is there any way to 
somehow, I mean, I know there's an instrument and the state sort of mandates what we have to do, but is there any way we can get around some of that or minimize some of that? And, um, and I also wonder what, what Superintendent Morris feels about trying to do this. I guess that would be important to me. I think we're, we're veering into actually talking about the evaluation. So my, I might suggest that we put this conversation on our agenda for next week um, and, and understand that the point of that, the conversation next week will be to, to discuss the timeline. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Spitzer. So I'm going to be um, in a location without Wi-Fi for next week. It's my one week, hopefully, vacation. And I know I've been leading a lot of these conversations about the evaluation. I don't want to slow down the conversation, but maybe this would be something where I could talk to somebody else on the committee offline to kind of do a little planning prior to my departure, which will be Saturday morning. I, I, just putting that out there. We can, again, I don't want to get more time now. I, answer, I, you... Yeah. Okay. I'd be willing to coordinate. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay. So we have, um, so we added the evaluation timeline to next week. I thought I saw somebody else's hand up. Did I imagine that? No, okay. Okay. Um, we have warrants. Um, I think I probably have um, several, but I, I might, since we know we're meeting next week, I might report on them next week, um, Dr. Morris. So um, respectfully, if we could vote, I, I, you know, if the committees could vote on warrants, because that's how we pay people. Um, and um, I think there's some committees that, I don't know, and I don't remember which ones, but I apologize, that uh, if they do have warrants that could be voted tonight, it would, it would help with that. Um, so I, I hate to be a pusher at, 10.03 uh, in the evening, but I think if there are some warrants, um, actually, no, I'm thinking of the old system. I was, just, I was just gonna ask the question. I thought, wait, I thought if we signed I it. I, I'm, I'm living in 2019, my apologies. <laughs> it was a much nicer world. We really, it would be lovely right now, 2019, but uh, that's not where we are today. My apologies. Okay, so, um, oops, I just lost the agenda. Um, unless, uh, Carrie, you, unless you have some, since you won't be here next week, maybe you want to. I'm happy to. I think I have three of them, but um, maybe if you want to keep talking about agenda while I pull them up, feel free. I'm just going well, to. I okay. think while she's pulling them up, I just want to note that there is a Pelham School Committee uh, tomorrow afternoon. Pelham School Committee meeting, excuse me, tomorrow right. afternoon. Brief, brief meeting, I think. Yes, very brief, 3 p.m. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. This is, this. All right, um, so I'm just, okay, I'm not muted, great. Okay, so I, uh, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $791.50 for the warrant dated July 22nd, 2020. I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $9,719.94 for the warrant dated June 28th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $9,665.93 and other funds in the amount of $54.01 for a med middle school gift. And this was signed on August 4th, 2020. Finally, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $1,755,014.98 for the warrant dated July 29th, 2020, for general fund expenses of $1,754,914.98 and revolving fund expenses of $100. And this was signed on 
August 4th, 2020. And those are the three. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any gifts? No. Um, okay. So um, I will move to adjourn, adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Nope. I'm sorry. I thought you were, I forgot your double chair. And I was thinking, <laughs> I'm like, don't adjourn the region yet. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> I'm moving to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a Lord second? second? Lord second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. There's no discussion. Um, Mr. Demling. Mr. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Ms. Hall. Thank you. Is there a motion for Pelham? I move we adjourn the Pelham School Committee meeting. Second. Second. Great. Okay, I will do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. And Mr. Menino? Oh. We'll count it. We're all <laughs> aye. All right. Hello, we don't have it. Oh, yes, Ron, you didn't disappoint. All right, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, and then I am um, moving to adjourn the regional school committee and enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation of APEA, AFSCME, and UFCW if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares with no intention of returning to open session. So I declare.